right, we are live. Hello, everybody. Today is December 1st, 2019, and I have a very special guest on today, Moray King. Say hello. Hi, thanks for having me on. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is going to be exciting, exciting episode. We got a lot to cover, so why don't we just jump right into it? Um, well, how about first and foremost, like, why don't you tell a little story, like, about you, like, what got, what, what, what brought you here, I guess. Yeah, um, I've been uh, researching uh, ideas on the zero point energy. I'll go into why in the world that I know about it because it turned out that I never heard of it back back when I was a student, graduate student, electrical engineering, systems engineering. And then it was during the oil crisis of 1974 that I that um, I learned of of this energy. I had a roommate in. Uh, he was in physics, graduate physics, and he had that big book by Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler, Gravitation. And he says, have you seen this? And he showed me the last two chapters. It was Wheeler's theory of geometric dynamics, and he was applying the zero-point energy uh, to, to gravity and just, just worked through the equations. He says, my gosh, you this fantastic picture of the fabric of space. And I was astounded because I never heard of it. So I'll, I'll mention it in the, sl in the slideshow too, because it's a key. It's often a key question. What's going on? So one thing led to another. What I did was I studied the uh, the literature on it. I asked the question during the oil crisis: uh, Could this be tapped as an energy source? And since I didn't know anything about it, I went to the library, and, and sure enough, in the physics journals, there, were, there was a ton of information, and I started to study study it. Now in the old days, it was called the ether and, and things like that. Uh, and then I realized, gee, this is being taken seriously by the physics community as really existing. So you're and, uh, you're studying for electrical engineering and then crossed over right, to the uh, physics? Oh, and systems engineering, right. Okay, and I okay. finished all the coursework for my PhD, and then I switched over to physics. <laughs> so you, because, do you have a PhD? Like, it, are you? No, I did not complete the thesis. Okay. In fact, uh, you could say my books uh, that I've uh, published uh, will, will become the thesis later. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, the world has to accept this as existing right. and as a, as a real energy source. And, and then uh, at that point, uh, we, we'll have succeeded. <laughs> And, and, and basically, it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating uh, topic to say, gee, this could be right in front of our noses all this time, and, it, and we just have to learn to tap it. Right. I'm and, excited and about it. And so that, that was the idea, is, uh, what, what activates it? So it's basically, I came, I came from the background of studying the physics. So why the phrase zero-point energy or zero-point vacuum fluctuations? Because that's what was in the physics literature. Right. And, and so I, I studied from that point of view. I certainly uh, knew about the ether and the history, and I certainly and I studied that as well because that was come those ideas from the 17th and 18th century. Right. So it's it's easy to see that in the history, uh, we have the history of, of you could say humanity in our science. We've had this energy uh, in the background. She uh, was called ether in the 17th and 18th centuries. It was postulated to exist to support the propagation of light. Right. In 1905, when special relativity becomes accepted and the Michelson and Morley experiment says, hey, I don't see much of an ether drift. By the way, it's interesting, Dayton Miller continued those experiments, the Michelson and Morley type interferometer experiments. Right. And when he uh, continued them on Mount Wilson, he, he saw the ether drift when he went up higher. He got the same results as Michelson uh, at, at sea level. And in fact, that was a small effect. It wasn't like you couldn't feel the ether rushing by like, like a wind. The, I, the uh, experiments supported the concept of an ether drag, where it's dragged along by, by the Earth. And so we, uh, we had this hydrodynamic-like model that seemed to be somewhat supported. And boy, and Einstein hate, hated Dayton Miller and his experiments because uh, he, he would say, oh, you can't just postulate the ether is non-existing. But you get all the experiments as if they don't ex as, as if it doesn't exist. For example, in the Earth laboratories, because you just uh, see a very small effect, you won't see the wind because the Earth the Earth is dragging it, dragging it along. And it's just like in hydrodynamics, boundary layer problems, right. and you get into very complex physics. 
In fact, the complexity is really the reason it was dropped from physics. And you'll see it's going to even get worse as we get into the uh, as theories of the zero point energy and where it comes from and all, all these ideas. The physics gets overwhelmingly complex. So it's so much easier just to pretend it doesn't go, doesn't exist. And they use techniques, mathematical techniques called normalization to basically just make it go away and only have the residual terms that you care to have to explain the physics and the experiments. And one of the problems is it makes the physics too, too flexible because you can start uh, having more terms and, right. and coming in the equations. This, and then, this like um, singularity and like infinite, infinite uh, equations, right? Stuff like that. Right, they go to infinity yeah. and you have these contradictions. We'll address some of this in the, in the slide deck because it, it was it was the issue uh, for me. So basically, going from I never heard of it. Uh, moreover, none of my phys engineering professors heard of it. I had to jump over the physics department just to have people to talk to right. that heard that heard of it. But the, my engineering professors saw my enthusiasm, so then they invited some speakers to come uh, to, to Penn to, to, to give lectures on, on these ideas. And, uh, so it's kind of cool going from, I never heard of it, the professors never heard of it, and I said, look, it's right in our physics literature. I could pull, pull a document, a journal article, a journal article in various books. You don't even hear about it until graduate uh, physics. So I jumped into graduate physics uh, and, and studied quantum mechanics just to just to learn about it and quantum electrodynamics. And so I just said, this is worth exploring. It was just better off that some people explore it rather than decrees uh, from engineering or people that didn't, didn't hear about it. Oh, it can't exist. Right. And uh, and and never explore it. You're, you're just better off. Uh, we might have something well, right under our noses. There's not, what's the fun in that, too? Just going along with the beat of everyone else's drum, right? You got to make a little noise. <laughs> and, right. And then you'll realize that the real reason for removing it is just the complexity. You just couldn't do things with, with nice, close expressions in math. It got overwhelmingly complex. Yeah. And you get into chaos theory and everything else. Right. And it's just so much easier. Just just oh just make it go away yes. and so that's what we're sitting at uh, and then of course I looked at the inventors I looked for where the energy anomalies were and uh, typically they were in the plasma experiments right where they would know they would notice uh, energetic effects coming from the uh, plasmas especially during uh, the ion motion of plasmas and abrupt discharges in plasmas and that's where they were seeing the energy anomalies and so I would say, okay, there could be evidence there. Of, and the theory was kind of supporting it, uh, that it could exist uh, as these energetic anomalies, especially on abrupt ion motion right. and the ion acoustic modes of the plasmas. And then I started to study what the, uh, what the inventors were doing. And they were doing experiments, especially in the plasma tubes and, and, and that sort of thing, where, where they were getting these anomalies, doing the, these various plasma experiments. So it's, it started to fit together. Could they actually be tapping into the vacuum energy? And of course, the a famous inventor, T. Henry Moray, <laughs> when I discovered his work in the mid-70s, it was his last name was identical to my first name. And that was uh, such a synchronicity for me. I said, I'm, I'm destined to, to explain that device. And it was right out here in Salt Lake City. And I'm right, and I'm right in the area. I got, got recruited to come to Utah to study this energy back in the 70s. And I said, wow, he was doing it with plasma tubes. And right. he was the run that stressed that he would get the effect when he oscillated the ions in the tubes. Right, he basically and, used a vacuum technology and was like, um was like putting in, from my understanding, putting in radioactive material, is that correct? Like stuff yeah, like that? Yeah, to keep the plasma going, but right. it wasn't, they weren't vacuum Ionization. tubes. Ionization, they weren't, they weren't uh, vacuum? They, they were, were not vacuum okay. tubes. They even said, even some of the high, some of the tubes were under high pressure, but he definitely ionized it. Right. And he would use the radioactive materials, typically like radium to keep the plasma going. So it didn't cost him any energy to keep, keep the plasma going. He just got, had to get the ions oscillating in the plasma. Right. And then it was his it was his observation and his stressing that the ion motion in the tubes and in the plasma is what was really activating the energy uh, to a large extent. And so I brought that 
I said, I'm going to take that very seriously, that my name synchronicity is just uh, <laughs> propelled to, to follow Mari's uh, hypothesis, and it was good. Everything fit together. The dots really connected very nicely, that the plasma ion acoustic mode was, was the key to activating excess energy. And then we could see under abrupt pulsing events, we would also get the plasmoids, the vortex ring effects, which Moray actually observed. He could make large ones in his tubes. Hmm. And that's what John Moray uh, told me. That's his son. I, T. Henry Moray, interestingly enough, died the very year that I got started. So it was 1974 that he first learned about the energy, and that was the year he, he passed away. Right, so you're carrying, and, um, carrying the torch, the Moray torch. Carrying the torch. <laughs> yeah, of course, John Moray's doing a terrific job. He's still alive, I think he's in his 90s, and he has the website, The House of Moray. And okay. he, I said, your job is to keep, keep the story alive, keep sharing the information, and so they wrote books, The Sea of Energy in Which the Earth Floats, and John has kept uh, the book alive and kept the story alive. So he's doing a really great job. And those, uh, the plasma experiments, of course, are difficult to do. You really to be very skillful at controlling the plasma and getting the circuitry to go right as you tune it in requires the skills of an electrical engineer. And, okay. and so it was difficult for most to do, and since most of the engineers never heard of the vacuum energy or zero-point energy, uh, they are, were unwilling to try any experiments. So we're sitting here with kind of a, a, a lacking experimental work, and of course the inventors, the garage guys, were very willing to do it. So the right. quest was, can I find a simple experiment so that everybody can succeed? Because what changes science is the repeating experiment. And if the scientific community doesn't want to jump on board and, and, and look at these experiments because of their beliefs, then we're left with what kind of a, where we are now. Right. Our beliefs are keeping us from even looking. Fortunately, the inventors have been doing the right thing and they stumble across it. They, they typically get a plasma effect, a pulsing, pulsing events. And I was searching for uh, what is the easiest uh, type of uh, event to do. What could a, the a garage just, guys do? Yeah, apparatus or experiment right. to carry out. And so I guess it gets in the slide deck because the easiest thing that they did where there were energy anomalies were uh, the, uh, the electrolyzer type experiments where they were observing this energy anomaly and they thought it was hydrogen, but something else was going on. And I guess that's what motivated uh, the this slide deck I'm about to share. Yeah, yeah it's loaded so up. So I think that's a good sego to, to get into it. It's load, loaded so up, let's, let's take uh, a look. Let's share my screen and we'll just... Okay. <clears throat> we look good there? I still see you, we have a little delay, let's see. Mm, still see you. Try uh, well, well, you should see me. Let me yeah. uh, try to share the slide deck or share the screen. It should switch over. Okay. Uh, oh, I had to. There we go. There we go. All right. Now let me make this large. Okay. I actually had to click share screen twice. There we go. There we go. Looks good to go. You, you, you have the reins. Yeah, so that so basically it was about ten years of research on on the electrolyzers and saying what what could be going on and uh, I knew I, I we'll we'll see that I knew that it couldn't just be hydrogen it was too, was way too much power on these devices and so there was a history along this people stumbled across doing the right thing. Uh, using water in these electrolyzers experiments, and we're going to see that we don't even need to do electrolysis anymore uh, on these experiments to get an energetic effect, a large energetic effect, in fact, from water itself. So uh, if you Google any of these names, you'll find there's a history of a water car, a car running on water, or a generator running on water, shelf running. Um, right. and is interesting history, typically followed by some type of suppression story, uh, as 
as they do as they do the device. There's also but, uh, Kansas is another one to throw on there. There's a bunch. Yeah, John Kansas. Yeah. There's, there's a lot more. There's a bunch. Uh, <laughs> and these were the ones that I would say that that ended up with running engines on, right. showing that there was a self that could get the engine to completely run, run on this. But my favorite, my favorite is the water car out of uh, Pakistan in, in 2012. It's still my favorite, all because of what the reporter said. When the physics professor said, oh, that violates the laws of the thermodynamics, the reporter said, why all the whining about violating the laws of thermodynamics? Tell me one law in Pakistan that has not been violated. <laughs> That's, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so I enjoyed that. So what's going on, right? Is there fraud? Is it hydrogen? Is it something else? Uh, I pose that question. Well, fraud is easy to, to say and prove. And the reason it's it's they, they say it's so easy to prove it has to be fraud is the internal combustion engine because it's so lossy. You lose most of your energy as heat. You're lucky if you get 20%, 25% in internal combustion. And, and then so whatever effect you have has to be like 5x, five times over unity just to make a gen set self-running. Because you know, the, the engine drives generator, and then you have to use circuitry to rectify the, the energy and then drive an electrolyzer. And so this closed loop system just has to be, is. Uh, has to have like a coefficient yeah, of like it's a spectacular claim yeah. something has to happen beyond combustion right to do it so <clears throat> it's easy for any anyone who has any knowledge in engineering or, or scientific knowledge saying this can't be <clears throat> because the internal combustion engine is so inefficient you right. can't make this self run <laughs> so that's why it's a spectacular claim so it could be could it be hydrogen? Well, because they're running electrolyzers, they're getting some hydrogen, so they naturally think that. But electrolysis itself cannot yield ex excess energy. Right. It simply costs you more energy to break apart the water molecule than you ever get back by burning the hydrogen. It's straight up uh, chemistry, really. Another way of looking at it is the water molecule is in a low energy state, and to break apart the bonds and make uh, molecular hydrogen that's on a higher energy state if it's atomic hydrogen that's in a higher energy state as still and if you take it all the way up to the plasma where the anomalies are that's even a higher energy state you're right. putting energy in to, to get it up there so uh, hydrogen cannot explain it moreover if you're just trying to get the normal behavior of a car it costs you about three to five hundred liters of 300 to 500 liters of uncompressed hydrogen just to mimic the behavior of a car, which you can get out of gasoline. And these electrolyzers are not even coming close to producing these amounts, maybe 10 to 20 liters per minute. So it's way, way out of bounds to say it has to be hydrogen. Yeah, so what about resident disassociation? They say, hey, if I just drive my water just drive the uh, water molecule at its resonant frequency with the atomic bonds I could just shake the water apart right. of course you're still putting energy into the system you're just using it more efficiently so I said well, okay wh what do you think the resonant frequencies are for the water mo molecule well you just look it up the, uh, the bonds are basically up at the terahertz frequency in the infrared band. So they're not a, nobody's driving their electrolyzers like these types of frequencies yeah, that yeah. would actually just break apart the water molecule. And so that's not what's going on. But what about this magical frequency? You hear about this uh, in the literature all over the, the HHO community. The hobbyists love to drive square waves at approximately 43 kilohertz. What about that? Where did that magic number come from? Have you ever heard of that? I yeah. have. I yeah, I've heard yeah. of that. And it, um, <clears throat> also, like, that's kind of the cap point of the auto audible spectrum, too. Like, for um, oh, the, you know, the transducers, the, the uh, piezoelectric transducers, like, that's kind of the cap sure. they go to, too. So it's really interesting. Right, uh, the ultrasonics were right. on the threshold of hearing. 
So where did this band magic number come from? It's an interesting history. Do you know the answer? I do not. <laughs> Comes from Keeley. Okay. Keeley uh, was a famous inventor working mechanically, working with uh, acoustics and ultra ultrasonics. Okay. He was channeling information. He was completely outside of our science, what he was doing. It was just amazing the things he was doing. He was an antenna to the universe, right? Oh, he was. <laughs> there's something going on because the information coming from his work, well, there's plenty of uh, researchers, Dale Pond, uh, 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 Dan Davidson, that really dove into the Keeley information. And uh, it was clear to me Keeley was channeling from beyond because it was coming up with this information. He, he and was he known was for his one... water hammer, his water hammer stuff yes. too, right? Yeah, and producing like... excess energy right. on a mechanical water hammer device to get stuff right. run. It was he was the one that came up with that magic number, forty-two okay. eight hundred hertz. He says he's dissociating uh, water right into ether. That's what he declared. Right. So Dale Pond. Uh, told Stan Meyer about that. And Stan Meyer just uh, lit up and says, there's the magic frequency. And of course, Stan Meyer was highly prolific in, in, in sharing his information. So the entire HHO community uh, jumped on board and said, this has to be the magical frequency because Stan says so. And Stan arranged to uh, drive his devices at this, at this frequency. So that's kind of the history where it came from. So it's interesting that good old Keeley was the one who started that. But that frequency actually we'll see does something for us. And, and we'll, later on in the slide presentation, we'll see exactly what that frequency helps to do. But instead of tearing the water apart, what if the ultrasonic frequencies actually make something in the water? And that's what uh, Walt Jenkins discovered. He likewise, his roots was uh, electrolyzers and that's why he named his company H2 Global. But as he did his experiments, he found a way to do it without using electrolysis. And that was the key because he finally came up with a clean experiment that rules out hydrogen. He does not make hydrogen. And he, his company was named H2 Global because that was his roots. He originally was doing electrolysis experiments, uh, just like everybody else, and he thought he was. And he really uh, thought somehow hydrogen had to be involved until, he, uh, until we finally met. And then I said, well, here are some of your alternatives. And then he said, wow. Hmm. And, and of course, I said wow because, to him because you finally came up with the clean experiment that rules out hydrogen. And so I proposed this hypothesis back in 2015, where I suggested thunderclouds are actually topping the zero point energy in every single lightning stroke. And I, I presented that uh, to the conference in Bulgaria in 2015. And, and I said, imagine taking a handful of thundercloud material and putting it into an internal combustion engine and then a, giving it an abrupt electrical discharge, mimic a thundercloud. There was excess energy there uh, on, in that plasma, and we'll see why in a moment, and why it, there was excess energy. And this is what uh, H2 Global, uh, sorry to inter interject, but this is what H2 Global was working on they too? Actu well, they actually ended up doing that. Yeah, and we'll okay. See, because he made it, uh, we'll see this video that he put up, that's how I first learned him, I'm running a jet set just on the water, what he was doing. Hmm. So what was he doing that's different than what everybody else was doing? Well, it was right there in his patent, patent application. And he, uh, he made the patent application in 2011, so he's the first to file on this, so he is truly the discoverer of what to do on this energetic effect. And this is what he did. He used an ultrasonic fogger. He just bought the, those commercial ones out of China. They make a lot of visible fog. That's where the 1.6 megahertz came from. And what he did that was very important was he charged the fog with electrostatic grids, did not draw any current, very, very little current, but he got the charge, the fog, uh, got the fog particles to be charged. Right. And, the, and this became very important because the active charging up the fog particles actually made them very strong. Hmm. Do you know around the, uh, oh, there it says right there, kilovolts, 100 to 200 kilovolts? 
There we go. So he uh, embedded a wide plasma spark plug, a okay. uh, nice stir at the what, top. What about on the grid? Do you know um, what he was using? Like DC voltage probably, but you know, like well, what, I what don't, range? He did not say in the patent okay. exactly what his uh, DC voltage was. He did rectify it uh, to, to DC to, ch to charge the grids. Um, but he, but he drives a spark plug. Look at these uh, voltage. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's a normal spark plug is driven about 50 kilovolts. So there wasn't the a patent. He drove it at 100 to 200 kilovolt, and he fires the spark plug for the full downstroke of the piston. He's surrounding his fog with plasma. Yeah. And doing these techniques allowed him to actually run just purely on just the fog. That's that's incredible. But here's the key question: How can a fog particle be a fuel? After all, they're just symmetrical droplets of water on the, on the order of a micron to a half a micron. That's what visible fog is, so you can just see it. And if you subjected it to a, an abrupt electrical discharge, you would expect it just to blow apart. But if the fog particle were sufficiently strong, the surrounding plasma could start to make it dimple in, in towards a torus form. And as it's surrounded by the plasma, a plasma vortex ring, you would actually make a vortex ring of plasma on the order of a micron. Right. And this, this vortex ring ends up being uh, highly, highly anomalous with excess energy. And we're going to see why uh, as, as we drill into what the other inventors have discovered, making this ball lightning like microscopic plasmoid form basically a vortex ring a ring that closes on itself so if you can imagine a slinky and just closing it into a torus you have two types of flows and a vortex ring doesn't like to close on itself this is like a tornado connecting uh head tail to head you have to make it all at once but it does exhibit a natural stability and it's famous for producing excess energy. And now we have to ask the question, where does that energy come from? And how is it manifesting in this ball lightning form? So in some so, way, in some way, it's creating like a quantum um, amplifier to what, what would be the zero point energy, right? Is what. Right. This yeah. is where we make the connection. Here's the big hypothesis that the ball lightning co coheres the zero point energy. And, and gets way too much energy into this plasmoid type of form. And one of the things we'll see that it does is it accelerates very, very abruptly. It kind of self-accelerates. And this is the big anomaly that would end up causing excess force on the piston. So this is what the question was. Zero point energy, what the heck is that? That's where we got uh, to where we, where we were introduced. I never heard of it nor did any of my professors. And so it was when I ran into the work of John Wheeler in this book, Gravitation, by Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler, and that's where I learned that it existed. And I said, this is fantastic. I never heard of it. And how can, can it possibly exist, right? And there was the book he wrote, Geometric Dynamics, that was published in 62. I checked it out from the library, read the book. I said, this is fantastic. Could this possibly be uh, tapped as an energy source? And that got me started. And the literature w was full of it, full of information on zero point energy. So what I did was I took the physicist seriously. I said, what if it's really, really there? Rather than saying, oh, it's just a fictional thing. It can't be, it can't be. Uh, I, just, I just took them seriously at their word. And I says, okay, let's just explore it. Right? You might be right. It might exist. And basically, it's the energetic vacuum that comes from quantum electrodynamics. It gives rise to the uncertainty principle. Uh, that's the energy. It gives rise to paraproduction. And paraproduction was a Dirac's theory of, of electrodynamics, where the vacuum itself gives rise to these short-lived electron-positron pairs, uh, all rising from the zero-point energy. They uh, derived the spectrum for it. Uh, and this was coming from Wheeler's work. It had to be the energy density increases as the cube of the frequency. So the energy keeps going up and up and up. Uh, and, and, and if they don't use this equation, 
uh, they do not get self-consistent uh, theories of in quantum electrodynamics to, to explain what's going on in, in the theory of electromagnetism, especially as it relates to charge and getting into quantum theory. So they needed this to, to be self-consistent. But as you can see, if the energy density keeps going up, it seems to produce a contradiction. And they call this contradiction in the actual literature the vacuum catastrophe. This is a colorful, colorful uh, description of how is it possible to have this infinite energy density, and yet when we look around us in normal our normal 3D world, we don't see these energetic events at all. We just see, you know, just right. background fluctuations that are very small. And so this this is essentially uh, the contradiction that has confronted that has confronted physics, and Wheeler derived it. He says, "Okay, just let's just follow the equations and see where this contradiction leads." And correct me if I'm so, wrong, uh, but that's like one of the biggest um, problems in physics right now, too, <clears throat> right? That's absolutely. one of the top problems that physicists are trying to solve. Yeah, and ironically enough, uh, Wheeler actually solved it. He called it the already unified field theory, but nobody could, could believe his, his solution because, oh, it's, it's you, know, you will see it's too fantastic. I'll show you a number of slides uh, later. Uh, Nassim Harriman, I like this video because he has a great sense of humor as he talks about this yeah. topic. Uh, this is the PVS version of it. They're just exploring. This is what contra. Uh, this is what's happening in quantum electrodynamics. And uh, I kind of was, as I was watching this, they at the very end, you know, they then they asked the question. Somebody said, "Well, can we ask this? Uh, can we tap this as an energy source?" Now he spent the you know the first twelve minutes of this video, just saying, "Oh, we're so puzzled by this. Nobody understands this in, in the theories." Of, of the vacuum, and uh, we are, are just scratching the surface. We don't really understand it. And then he gives the, when asked, well, can we tap it as an energy source? He goes, absolutely not. And when he said that, I laughed and laughed. I says, wait a minute, you just said, we spent 12 minutes explaining we don't understand it, and now you're making absolute decrees? The correct answer is, we don't know. We're yeah, just the be. front end. <laughs> Right, a more scientific of, of approach. discovering what's <laughs> going on, right? Yeah, they yeah. don't just make absolute decrees. Well, we're going to see there's a reason why people are making absolute decrees because of the complexity, what it implies. And I like Lee Smolin. He, he explores, he does a great job of looking at quantum gravity, trying to unite general relativity or quantum electrodynamics. And he says, there's a single vacuum fluctuation. This, this picture came from his book. Very, very fast. As it comes in, it's very tiny. It's on the order of what they call the Planck length. It's 10 to the minus 33rd centimeters, right? That's uh, well, one followed by 33 zeros. <laughs> very, very, very tiny. Very, very tiny. Uh, uh, it's basically 20 orders of magnitude smaller than, than elementary particles. And so this, this is just fluctuating away. You can ask the question, where does it come from? Right, as soon as you ask that question, you have two choices. You can say it comes from nowhere, at which point you have to give up conservation of energy. Say, oh, okay, we can have energy from nowhere. Or you can ask, where does it come from? Well, Wheeler derived where it came from. So there's the key question. Basically, it comes from a higher dimensional space. It's straight out of Wheeler's work, well, using general relativity, and of course, they have higher dimensions in general relativity. And these days, they have higher dimensions in um, Brain theory and string theory, they're accepting that, uh, existing in uh, real, real physics. When I started this and would present this to the engineers and the scientific community, they said, oh, that can't exist, you're a kook. There can only be the three-dimensional theories. So I was quite alone in the beginning as I was trying to present these ideas. And I said, these are not my ideas, these are Wheeler's ideas. And basically, this flatland slot, this is the analogy, pretend this is a plane like the tabletop. And this is all we can see in our uh, two-dimensional universe where we have no awareness of the higher dimensions, the third dimension. And basically, this energy is penetrating at right angles. So as it enters and leaves uh, through the higher dimensions, this would be on the left, the background, incoherent vacuum fluctuations. If there's a slight tilt to it as it comes through, a little bit of lines in our three-dimensional space, 
and we call it a polarized vacuum. And then we'll speculate, or what if there's vorticity as it comes through? And, and, and this would be like a flow maintaining the elementary particles. So the analogy Wheeler uses is if this, the flow of the zero point energy flux is like the stream, a stream and a whirlpool in the stream is maintained by the flow. So the idea there is all elementary particles owe their existence to this constant flux of zero point energy to maintain their existence. So it's quite a fantastic uh, a speculation, if you will, Just a, this was Wheeler's perspective orthogonal flux model of the zero point energy. And basically this is how you can have an infinity that appears to be embedded in a point. Because what happens when you get singularities in the equations of physics, it means your, your modeling was inadequate to account for all the phenomena going on. In this case, a higher dimension. So if you have a higher dimension that's orthogonal and your equations collapse it into a point because you just want to do three dimensional modeling, of course, you're going to have a contradiction. You'll have a singularity. And could this help explain? Which is something explain, that goes to infinity. Yeah, could this help explain things like dark energy and dark matter and stuff like that? I mean, there's exactly. a big missing holes in physics. Right. There are plenty of suggestions. Oh, the dark energy is the zero point energy, and the dark matter maybe you know bending of the space time to produce too much gravity. So all these ideas are are all part of it, and and they are they will have to take the zero point energy seriously to say this is the foundation of everything. So how does, what does this look like from our three dimensional world expected? Well, the, uh, this electrical flux enters as if it's coming through those Planck sized mini white holes. And this is Wheeler's theory. He coined the name wormhole. It flux enters and then the flux leaves. So it enters through a mini white hole, it leaves through a mini black hole. And so it creates this constant turbulence that Wheeler called the quantum foam in the fabric of space. So you have, you have the ether really coming back into physics, but it's way, way better ether for energetic possibilities than the original hydrodynamic ethers from the 18th century, which are like fluid models, fluid theory models. Right. This model is a virtual turbulent plasma that's in constant chaos. It's in constant churning activity it's and, and it's fed by this constant flow of the zero point energy flux so uh this was wheeler's model and i said what a dynamic possibility for the for the ether itself and it does have some similarities to uh pair pair creation in a way too with um we'll show we'll show that in yeah. a second that's yes, you're absolutely right on how do we get these pairs but you can see it's naturally paired as the flux enters positive as the flux leaves it's it's negative so you have this polarizable medium that that has the nature of charge itself right. inherent to it and we're going to see oh, wow the nature of charge is from this as well so the question is can self-organization be triggered in this and so when i pose this questions to the physics professor they say no no uh, that entropy says everything has to decay to randomness. It, it, it can't be. You can't have self-organization. Then in 1977, Ilya Prigogine wins the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for showing that under certain conditions, self-organization may occur. And these conditions were in general system theory terms, which was which is my major, systems engineering. And these conditions where the system had to be highly nonlinear, like a plasma, had to be far from equilibrium, uh, and then would have to have an energy flux through it to maintain it. Well, the theories of the zero point energy fulfill these characteristics, thus opening the possibility that it could be tapped as an energy source without violating thermodynamics. Right. So the timing was perfect. Uh, when, when I discovered his work, because I was really stuck explaining this to the physics professors. I said, how could it possibly be? And then Pringagine showed how could the, this be possibly exist in general systems theory terms. So, uh, so the stage was set for these possibilities to be wide open. We just had to explore how do we do it, right? And of course, pair production is a tremendous self-organization. 
these electron positron pairs are huge compared to the individual vacuum fluctuations, uh, 10 to the uh, 20th times larger. It's like I'm organizing an Avogadro number uh, of these particles, organizing into these vortex ring-like forms to produce electron positron pairs that, that come into existence and come out of existence. The entire thing is churning with self-organization as these resonances and various forms come in and out of existence. The whole thing is ready to, to produce most of the energy is just passing through. This is all occurring in the turbulence right. of this. The theoretically, so we, it's we, like an invisible plasma in a sense, right? Right. All happening because it enters and leaves so, so readily, we don't see any net in our three-dimensional space right. unless we do the right thing. So the, um, I love Lachlan's book, another Nobel Prize winner, but he, he gave... He said the same thesis, everything, including the laws of physics themselves, emerges from self-organization, organizing collectives. So basically, we have this complex, very complex substrate to the existence of everything. And uh, the reason why people don't like it is because you can't do computations with trying to model it by pairwise right. particle interactions. It just overwhelms any any set of equations. Very you, complex you field field equations, right? Oh, right. Yeah. If especially if you wanted to use particles, yeah. right? So particles don't even exist until the self-organization occurs. But there's so probabilities, the, uh, right? I mean, probabilities could apply, could be used. Yeah, and that's what they do. But they say we just got to make most of it go away, which does most of it goes away. They, that's what renormalization is about, and, and adjusting. The equations of physics so they can uh, make tenable equations where they linearized equations make most of the terms go away and then they can start to do the quantum electrodynamics right make it so easier if to you digest. say <laughs> right yeah. but if you said you can start to really tap it for appreciable energy then they say oh my gosh we haven't accounted for that we have to have more terms still come in the equations and there and therefore we don't know everything what well, would mean that uh we just can't make everything disappear. And then our math doesn't necessarily apply. The simple linearization uh, mathematics that we do, uh, which is basically a Taylor's expansion, to simplify the equations just so it's tenable, it would be untenable to do the mathematical computations that they typically do in, um, in, in all of quantum electrodynamics, uh, whether it's string theory or the standard model or any of it. It is. It would become overwhelmingly complex if you're trying to model the self-organization by individual point-particle interactions. So it's any physicists, over... any physicists who are listening right now, want to uh, take a crack at that? Yeah. <laughs> Feel well, free. they know. Well, what they know better. You can't do it, right? They know it's. We can't even get started. Physics would have to start all over again. Let's say the vacuum becomes the the vacuum dynamics becomes the most important thing in, in science. So prior to going to all that trouble of coming up with new theories of, 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 of the vacuum and everything else, I think an experiment would be in order. We need a definitive experiment that says, yes, 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 we are definitely observing excess energy being tapped here. And then at this point, the theoreticians could come on board and say, is it worth going to the trouble of trying to make a theory of, of the underlying vacuum? And, and I, I agree. I think the experiment comes first uh, because, because all this theory is just overwhelmingly complex and it's just easier just to make all that vacuum energy go away so we can ignore it. Right. And, and so best, that's where we're at. And it's always best to ask nature the questions, right? Because nature gives, <laughs> nature gives the true answers. It's just our, our ability to decipher it is the challenge, right? Right. So, and so... And before we go to this trouble, let's get motivated by a real, real experiment. Yeah. And that's the important thing. That's the important thing in science. And so if we don't like the theory of the vacuum, that's fine. You can come up with another theory, but you're going to have to explain the energetic anomalies. And guess where we see these energetic anomalies? We're going to see them in these vortex ring forms in just a second. But uh, here's an example of, of the physics literature that I found. The Physical Review is our most prestigious journal in the United States. And Timothy Boyer was the leading proponent uh, back in the 70s when I got started. And he was showing how all quantum effects can, can arise from matter's interaction with the zero-point energy uh, how put off showed how the hydrogen atom can be stable uh, due to the zero point energy. 
Uh, this was a very important uh, paper up for an energy source in 1993. Um, they showed how can it be it can be in principle an energy source without violating thermodynamics. A very important um, paper politically because when the people declare, oh, it can't be possible to violate thermodynamics, no, it wouldn't. It's 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 a it, the possibility ex exists. And so when you make the discovery, we're not going to violate our science at all. It just means that the, the complexity vacuum gives rise to, to these possibilities, and we just go with the flow. He also showed how it can give rise to gravity as well as inertia. And this inertia paper created a lot of excitement because it, it showed that, gee, if we could start to control the zero-point energy in so any coherent fashion, we can make a gravitational drive where we where we'll bend space-time and, and, and can accelerate without feeling the inertial stress. So it's like, like, a, like a flying saucer type propulsion. So this, uh, this uh, opened up the possibilities in our science. So if you could start to just cohere this energy in some, just say, even a statistical sense, uh, all these possibilities open up as really, really existing to humanity. In, in, it'll be in our science. The science has always been there. It's just we just don't understand the, the rules of the game. Like opening up another, a whole other system of like a whole other plateau of energy, right? Right. Th I mean, so, thermodynamically, it would, it's essentially just um, a larger system we haven't tapped into, right? So it wouldn't really be violating any laws of thermodynamics if we could tap into it, right? Is that what you're kind of saying? Exactly. Yeah. And that's what that's the point. If it exists, and and uh, these possibilities of interaction can exist, which they show in the quantum electric dynamics, it's interacting with every elementary particles. We get to the question: Well, then, how can we activate? How can we activate the zero point energy? Well, we use Pringagine's principles of system self organization. We work with a highly nonlinear system like a plasma. We abruptly drive it far from equilibrium. That's where all the abrupt discharge is giving an abrupt and electrical discharge. The more abrupt, the better. And then we maximize the zero point energy interaction uh, using the particles that do so, like ions. And we'll, we'll see why in a second. And likewise, vortex forms, especially of ions and, and plasma vortices, give rise to even bigger coherences still in the zero point energy. Now, normally, the, vac the conduction band electrons, this is just your normal electrons and wires in your normal circuitry, and they're described as essentially being in equilibrium with the zero point energy. And thus, you would really not see much in standard circuits. You would just not see much in the way of uh, over unity type energy effects, surprising energy effects in your normal electronics. However, if you work with the nuclei, and especially nuclei of the plasma, the nucleus has vacuum polarization with steep lines converging on the nucleus itself. And this is the particle that then can be used to trigger the self-organization in the zero-point energy. And if you jerk the ions or make an abrupt surge in the ions, this is where they observe the anomalies. You could see as this flux comes through, as we abruptly move these ions, a little bit of it bends into our three-dimensional space. And we'll see in these plasma activities, uh, especially pulsing plasmas, you'll see some excess energy events, high, uh, uh, large voltage spikes. If it couples to electrons in the plasmas, they'll, stuff their, they'll start to go into runaway electrons and anomalous heating. And so what we see is the idea is that the the ions are the key because they can bend some of the zero point energy flux into our three dimensional space. And so when we have that vortex ring of plasmoid, vortex ring, it starts that spin of a spin for that vortex ring, starts to ortho rotate some of that flux into it and gets trapped into the plasmoid. And so we have this. Uh, excess energy getting coupled in to these short-lived uh, plasmoid forms, these vortex ring forms, and that's how we harvest the energy. We make these forms. And one, and one of the uh, observations we'll see shortly is that when we do this, we have this self-acceleration characteristic. It'll just start to take off. 
And so these are the anomalies that are observed on these microscopic films. The self-acceleration, especially if they're up in space and are not, not hugging a dielectric. And they produce excess force uh, and they have excess energy. And so those are the anomalies, and we'll find out they're associated with these plasmoid forms, especially to harvest them in some coherent way where we can actually use them. That's how we trapped it. That's how we got to the energy that allows us now to build a technology around that. And so is there any evidence in nature? Well, thunderclouds. In fact, every lightning stroke, uh, they captured this from high-speed photography. Every lightning stroke has a precursor. You see a ball lightning precursor that carves a channel in the air, and as soon as one hits the ground, boom, they made a ionized channel for, for the lightning stroke to hit the ground. So this actually happens on every single electrical discharge. There is a, the tip of every electrical discharge has a little uh, plasmoid form on it. Even a weak electrical discharge, it still exists. And so there we have it, the, the abrupt event, the slight coherence in the zero point energy. But above the thundercloud, it's even more spectacular. We didn't really learn all this until we learned to do high-speed photography. And they, when they got, got the technology up to a million frames per second, uh, they detected above the thundercloud was incredible energetic effects. And the Sprite is one of the most spectacular. And it, 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 this large discharge comes from the halo region of the Sprite. And, right. uh, and it was from... Uh, it's huge. Here's one of the hugest that was ever seen, about 80 kilometers. It's about 50 miles high. They, they, and about that wide, lasting for a few milliseconds. They captured this on high-speed video. They, they have to get up in the plains above these thunderclouds and just kind of aim and hope for the best as they, as they, as they, take, as they take their video shots. So this, uh, this is incredible. Yeah, these are, How large this, is an all, this is all relatively new too because of the ability to for satellite shots and high high aerial um, photography and all that kind of stuff like is relatively right, new. The high, right, the high speed photography is, is what really the breakthrough that allows us to even uh, people that wouldn't uh, sometimes it was noticed by a pilot but nobody believed them. Right, they were slow. Ones. And here they they were captured. This this is a, a loop video of a single event. Sprite event. We'll see that here's the halo right here that it gives rise to the event. And, and they loop the video to show to show it repeatedly. Right. So there's there's the event. So they could not believe that these things are are there. And boy are they energetic. It's pretty cool. <laughs> And here's what uh, they found. Boy, their duration could be as quick as a millisecond. There could be huge. That was one of the largest ever, ever filmed. And sure enough, they detect the, the plasmoids. These are big ones. They're only order of 10 meters in size. Right, and they abruptly uh, accelerate up to a tenth of the speed of light. And, and they're launched from the halo. And they're, they detect the gamma rays, an actual anti- uh, antimatter uh, in the events themselves. And so the, how did they know they detected antimatter? It was from the satellites. They had the, the right. gamma ray satellites. Yeah, they call it and like black, black lightning and stuff like that too. It's, yeah, it's really interesting new and releases a ton of energy. Right, and what happened was the positrons and the electrons, well, the positrons, they, had, they got uh, trapped on the magnetic field lines, and they, they start to uh, go back and forth be on the uh, magnetic field of the Earth. And then when they hit the satellite again, they'll, they'll have the gamma, gamma rays from the positron-electron annihilation. And so they, they were able to show, wow, we really, really made antimatter in these uh, events, in these sprite events. So here we have antimatter production in, in, on Earth. Right, just from the thunderclouds themselves. Yeah. So this is uh, implications. My gosh, we could be tapping into that vacuum energy to get the, get that yeah. energy so concentrated 
to make the antimatter, make that per actual pair of productions. So uh, you do better if you do the experiments uh, right here on Earth and the abrupt electric arc experiments, they are detected anomalies. And uh, Professor Trowbridge first observed it uh, back on Harvard, 1907. He noticed that if he sprayed some water mist into a, a normal electrical discharge from an abrupt capacitive discharge, it was a lot louder. Big boom, boom a thundercloud. And, uh, and he couldn't explain it. Why, why would water do that? It's not a, not a fuel. How, how could that happen? Uh, Professor Frungel did likewise in Germany during the war. He studied and he knew that his force, this anomalous boom, is not from heat or steam. And later he applied it to do an electrosound device uh, to map the bottom of a lake. Right. On the uh, last experiments, uh, or on those on those experiments, do you know as far as the parameters of the experiments? What, was it like distilled water, like DI water, uh, or was there any was. type of uh, any type of anything in the water, like? Yeah, well, it was just water mist. It would have worked in distilled water. Uh, in rock fragmentation, they, they would say, get some water in the rocks, and then they do this arc, and, and they notice, oh, sometimes I see them when they studied it, to get an overunity measurement, and people just dismiss them. Oh, you just made a mistake. That's, that's, like, that's like Ed yeah. Lewis was talking about that on the show, too. I was, he, one of the things that he was doing is he smashed rocks together, and he noticed some, uh, some really interesting... Right, yeah. Plasmoids, basically, same. Kind yeah, of. you'll you'll get that on fractal emission, where cracking of a crystal occurs. You'll get the plasmoids coming off, just like earthquake lights. Hmm. But Preter Gnu really did the experiment. He uh, did the controlled experiment. He said, "I'll have a water chamber, and I'll and I'll uh, have a, a capacitor. I'll abruptly discharge the capacitor, and I'll propel a weight up into the air." And what Peter stressed was it was very important that the capacitive discharge had to be extremely fast. If the discharge was too slow, it would just get normal current and water and no anomaly, no right. force anomaly at all. But when he did that capacitive discharge very fast, he could propel the weight up into the air. He knew the energy on the capacitor, so he knew that uh, he was producing excess force and excess energy. But he also noted, gee, when I really go fast, I blow out the bolts on my containment vessel. Hmm. And I said, wow, you weren't even coming close to measuring all the energy manifesting from your event. Right. And he also gave a clue in high-speed photography, he would, he would capture a plasmoid form in, in, in the chamber itself. Well, Gary Johnson, an engineering professor from Kansas State University, repeated Grinot's work, but this time, he made a, his containment was two semispheres that he could make a spherical chamber with his water, and it was designed to blow apart. So when he gave it the abrupt capacitor pulse, it would fly up guide wires, these weighted chambers, so he can then measure how high it went up in the air, just videotape it, and then he could show every single capacitive discharge produce excess force and thus excess energy. Here we have a repeating experiment. Yeah, it's ingenious, really, if it's for simplicity's yeah. sake. Yes, and uh, he presented it at the various conferences, engineering conferences. He would present it at some of the energy conferences that would explore it. And he did not want to speculate on what the energy source was. He says, well, let the theorists come up with that, but here's your experiment. Right. Very well done experiment. And guess how the scientific community uh, responded to this information. Replication? No, they, <laughs> oh. they ignored it. So here we have the repeating experiment every single time. Just crickets, just ignored it because of the implications of where it would lead to. That's interesting. Uh, Harold Aspen uh, likewise was studying th this and he knew the ions were important too. So this on this paper that, that was published in the 80s, he says uh, the explosive effects are from, somehow it's from the ion discharges in the pure water. And this, and this website, uh, people say, well, can we apply it directly to an engine? And we'll just try to do an abrupt capacitive discharge in the engine and, pr and produce these effects. Well, it was pretty crude to do it with bulk water. It was very, very difficult to do. And you could also damage the engine with such a, an abrupt event. 
Uh, but here's a clue from uh, Peter's work, Peter Gnu. In high-speed photography, they could see the cool fog produced right around events that, that was happening. And Peter intuitively know, knew that somehow this, these micron-sized fog particles were very, very important. This was my colleague, David Faust. We did the research in the 70s uh, on, on uh, this topic. And we both got invited to Utah to, to come do the research at Iring. And he passed away in 2014. But his expertise was uh, cor corona discharge photography or Corellian photography. So uh, he was the author on the, uh, the article in Science magazine that was published and showing you got to really control the moisture content because that dominates the image. But they heard rumors about uh, ball lightning events from people's uh, uh, curly and apparatus photography. And what he did was he got himself a low light video camera. And what he discovered from a single pulse, high voltage pulse, unipolar, he could make uh, this ball lightning type event that was actually kind of dark. You couldn't really see it visibly except uh, rarely. Every now and then you could, you could see it. Uh, but with the low light camera, he could see it every time and he would see persistence that could last over a minute. And so he was actually foreshadowing a discovery this made is, by. This is in a like a Krillian plate, like um, yeah, water Krillian, in between. Just yeah. A yeah, Krillian photography apparatus. Very cool. A little bit of water spray kept it moist and he could trigger the event. But he is actually foreshadowing the discovery of this man, Ken Shoulders, who's really my hero because he was the one that, this, that studied these little plasmoid forms in detail. And we probably owe most of the information, experimental information about what's going off plasmoids to Ken Shoulders. It was his lifetime of research that uh, he dedicated. And he was funded, privately funded, to, to, to do this research. And so his roots started kind of like, you know, uh, very simple apparatus, just a sharp point cathode. Uh, he knew the energy on his capacitor, just an abrupt discharge from the capacitor. Likewise, he said it had to be very abrupt to get the effect. He, from the tip, would be launched one of these plasmoid forms, and it would tend to hug the dielectric, that's uh, an insulator, until it hit a conductor. And if it hit a conductor, it would make a crater. And his first clue was that crater is too big for the high melting point aluminum oxide uh, ceramics and the various conductors. That gave him a clue. Do I getting too much energy here? Because he knew how much he had on the capacitor itself. And so his definitive work was actually his patent. And this is a beautiful patent because he wrote it himself he did not write it in legalese. He wrote it in English, straight up English. And, and, and Ken Shoulders was a genius. It, it was very, very well written. This patent is well worth reading because, uh, because of how well it was written. And it's basically how he made the discovery and, and various applications of how he could apply it is described in the patent. Uh, Niari Mesiats, he's from the Russian Academy of Sciences. He got very interested in this topic in the 90s. He called them ectons and explained uh, how they, they are actually formed. So in this, in this slide, imagine this point cathode. This is a big blow up of the sharp pointed cathode. And he says a little bit of liquid metal uh, is, is, it melts on the very tip. And, and there's a protuberance just before the discharge. It comes out into the surrounding glow plasma around the point. And then the tip of that blows off, the tip of that liquid metal. And you have a symmetric blob of liquid metal. Uh, and the flow of that explosive event is a natural vortex ring flow. So notice that to make these things, we needed a blob of matter. In this case, it was liquid metal. And he can make these every single time. And we needed that symmetry and that blob of liquid metal in order to make the plasmoid form. Uh, Ken Shoulders gave him the main name electron volitum. That was Latin for strong charge. Later on, when he became convinced that they uh, were really, really tapping into the quantum vacuum 
uh, zero point energy. He changed the acronym to EVO, Exotic Vacuum Object. But he was unwilling to commit until uh, what it exactly what it is until he was really, really convinced from his experiments that he had excess energy. And he measured, they manifest a charge about 100 billion electrons. They seem to drag along about a million ions, and they always exhibited the charge to mass ratio like the electron. And so he noticed that pattern, that charge to mass ratio keeps coming up in nature. It's like the electron, the self-organization. And then they contained excessive energy. I don't know if this website is still active. He, he passed away, but a lot of people are trying to keep his work active. He wrote a number of papers and they were readily available on the website. But if you Google Ken Shoulders names, you, you can get to the work. Yeah, I just, I just posted it um, in the chat it's for anybody who's interested. They can go and take a look at the, the patent for charge clusters. And, and uh, right, if you Google his name, you'll, you'll, you'll get to his, his papers because a lot of researchers are keeping his work alive. This is perhaps, I told him this, this is the most definitive of your discoveries, the positive EV. It likewise exhibit the charge to mass ratio like the positron, but it was not comprised of a collection of positrons. And when it hit the conductor and dissipated, it never emitted any gamma rays from the electron positron annihilation. It was, a, it was like a coherence, a coherence of actual charge from the vacuum itself. And he always got that same charge to mass ratio. And he got pair production of these things. This was like a self organization in the vacuum, except these were big particles uh, on the order of a micron in size. And, and you could see they here they would uh, spiral around each other. And when they struck the, the conductor, they would make a, a dual crater. And so he was getting to the essence of how the vacuum self-organizes in the charge. He, it, it's this self-organizing event that he was that he was making in this. And I said, there's there's your empirical proof that there's something fantastic going on. And it gets into the heart of what is charge. And what is the nature of the self-organization that could be occurring? So these are the definitive experiments that really imply there's something fantastic going on and the possibilities that can exist in the vacuum, all done from basically an abrupt discharge. An abrupt electrical discharge starts to manifest these events. And here he, uh, what he called the black EVs. They could go dark when they're on a dielectric, so they don't dissipate. They like to hug the dielectric because there's the electrostatic attraction keeps them just just from taking off. And so we uh, can make these dark ones that could last for minutes, and an electric pulse would reactivate it. You could see it again. So it's like a dark mode light. plasma, almost like a. Yeah, and 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 Dave Faust was detecting the same thing. And so uh, we're starting to see this anomaly, this self-organizational evidence that something, something energetic really exists uh, for in this form. And there he loved studying their acceleration. When he launched these in air, that's when he would see them take off. He would abruptly accelerate up to the tenth of the speed of light. Uh, he would call propulsion. That was the name he, he used. And he was kind of like he really had the dream of of inventing and to making the discovery of this type of propulsion where he could just drag along the debris. And uh, Sir Fadi was suggesting, oh, you're making like an, uh, a warp drive event where coherent the actual zero point energy in the fabric of space, we're self accelerating like a warp drive or like a flying saucer type propulsion. And here's what's exciting. In this type of propulsion, you do not feel the inertial stress. You're, you're caught up in the field. You're, you're controlling uh, inertia itself. But this would be on the it. basis that we understand what gravity is or we've discovered the graviton, like that, this particular slide, right? And that's not the right. case. Right. I guess with this, with this uh, from uh, Alcabari's uh, right. warp drive that he derived, he's straight up from general relativity. If right. you have enough energy, right. you can then warp warp space like this, where there's no way we can provide that type of energy and that type of energy density, but it's already there, provided inherent to the fabric of space itself. 
it's just basically there. You just got to get control of it. And making these vortex ring forms, uh, we start to cohere this energy and it starts to take off like the self-acceleration. So basically these, these plasmoid forms, especially made in air, where they're not hugging a dielectric, they're exhibiting this for a few milliseconds, this warp drive-like anomaly, this excess force that, that's actually huge. And so we're, once again, tapping into that vacuum energy for the source. So basically, in our science, we have, uh, in principle, the, the, the knowledge to, in, our, in our physics to say a flying saucer type uh, drive is possible. And uh, we haven't learned to control it, but we're seeing uh, beginning experiments to show, oh my gosh, we have the anomaly for a few milliseconds uh, that, that it really, really exists. And so we need to harvest that anomaly. Speaking of trying to harvest it, uh, Ken's shoulder says, if I make a vortex first, a vortex of water through a small borehole, and I shoot one of these EVs into the borehole, I make this huge coherence of the vortex itself, a plasma vortex. Occurring. And it's such a powerful pulse that uh, it would damage anything it hit. Uh, he called it the EV water gun. And uh, he, sh he shared this with me in 2000. And he says, I just cannot find a way to harvest it. Uh, anything it hits, it just punches a hole right through it. He used the analogy, it's like shooting a bullet at a windmill blade. And he couldn't really find a way to harvest the energy. It was way too concentrated. But that was the biggest of the energetic effects that he observed and, and he made. And he was trying to harvest it just straight uh, electrodynamically, or like was he yeah. also trying to use Right, heat in this or... case, mechanically. Just mechanically. Uh, yeah, that, of course, when it hit anything, we couldn't do anything with it. Uh, he get an EMP from it. If he could rectify some of that EMP, you could start to have it harvested that way. So he really wasn't, uh, didn't really take take it very far as far as how can I do the practical application as he was studying those individual ones. But what can we do as hobbyists? Uh, what can, what can we do if we're willing to look and try these experiments? So the goal is to make the easiest possible experiment. And we like to be make it clear with no other fuel involved, no hydrogen, no gasoline, just make a clear experiment. And then have it easy enough that we could have widespread replication and thus avoid the suppression problems. Most of these inventors, as they start to do the right thing and they start to harvest, harvest it, there's always a suppression story that shut these guys down and they won't communicate. And we'll, we'll go into some of these stories later on. So what's the best experiment? That's been my search all this time. Well, it turns out that this energetic fog gas coming from these water electrolyzers uh, seems to be it. And, and Yul Brown was probably the first to recognize there's something anomalous. There's way too much energy in the torch. Uh, he says this, this torch has an, uh, the Brown's gas coming from these electrolyzers. Uh, and he proposed uh, atomic hydrogen to to explain how it could be so powerful. And, and, and again, that's where the yeah, this is acronym. all really well documented too. Like um, if you if you just do Google searches on HHO gas, to, like the torches and stuff, it's really amazing, um, like what they're able this, to do. This right, in fact, that's exactly it. This gave me the clue as to what's going on. So that's what Yule Brown proposed. And that's why that name is stuck, HHO. That's why everybody calls it that. And that's because that's what Yule Brown called. It. That was his hypothesis on making atomic hydrogen to try to explain why it's so powerful. But it was a contradiction. It was a cool flame. It was not a hot torch at all. Just a little bit above the boiling plane of water. You could quickly pass your hand through, through, through the torch. It would not even boil water straight up when you hit it with the torch. Yeah, and yet, right. Yul Brown discovered, my gosh, I'm vaporizing tungsten, right? He says, how could this be? Uh, the, the vaporization point is such a huge temperature. Even the melting point's a huge temperature. And uh, when you're in air, you're not gonna vaporize it because you'll oxidize it first, right? right. In air, so, but he said this, he, that was this big anomaly. That he, he was sublimating tungsten and that was the big clue. Right. And again, because that's, that's here, very well documented for people 
listening, I mean, you can go on the internet and see tons of documentation about that. So I'm, it's really interesting that mainstream science doesn't talk too much about that particular phenomenon. Yeah, well, so. Oh, right. Uh, most people, oh, it's just as hydrogen. It can't be. But this was the big, big clue that I had because here we are as a low temperature torch and yet we're, we're interacting with the metal at uh, the manifesting uh, temperatures like this. But the reason that that the big clue uh, of this was because I knew Ken Shoulder's work and the Brown's gas contained these EVs. And because what was the key on Ken Shoulder's work? He says, when these EVs strike a metal, they cause the atomic bonds just to let go with coherent energy. Uh, of course, uh, that, that itself is too, very, very anomalous. And so they just let go. It melts too easily. Uh, and, and then when the electrons fall back to the ground state, that's when the metal starts to glow. And that's when you see the heat manifesting. But the actual disruption of the atomic bombs for, from the coherent EVs themselves. So this was the big clue because knowing that this phenomenon exists from Ken Shoulder's work, I said, the EVs have to be in the Brown's gas torch. And then that was that was the epiphany and i knew this was the experiment because now we're making abundant evs easily and uh we just had to explain how could these evs form in brown's gas torch so that was the that was the mystery right because i need a symmetrical particle like the blob of liquid metal that we saw from ken shoulder's work but what could it be What's in the water? So I was, I was researching the water literature. It has to be some type of water cluster or something like that. Um, George Wiseman, likewise, big proponent and big study student of Brown's gas. He proposed something similar. He says, there's something there in the water, something extra. He called it electrically expanded water and gave it this abbreviation. So I credit George Weissman with the first to propose there's something extra in the water. It's not just hydrogen. Um, and and th there was, and he made that discovery in 1996. So I credit George Weissman with first proposing that there's this extra thing in the Brown's, in, in the Brown's gas torch. One of the clues was when we seem to get this cool fog from some of these electrolyzers, it seems all those type of electrolyzers tend to produce anomalous energy, excess energy. So that was a clue. Uh, the HHO missed a lot of activity coming off the surface of the water. Uh, I guess I could play this video. You have plenty of time, right? Yeah, it should play. Should be play fine. Yeah. So here's the activity. So there we go. It wasn't steam. See, we have this cool fog coming off and this uh, mist and coming off from the torch itself. I'm sorry, from, from the electrolyzer fluid. This is on top of the... So these type of electrolyzers seem to produce the bigger effect when they had this observation associated with it, producing a lot of this cool type fog coming off of it. Yeah, that's, so there's no, that's not hot at all. That's just from Right. Now, now, if you really overdrive your electrolyzer, you can make steam, of course. Right. Right? You just get a lot of standard current in there. You'll, you'll really overdrive it. But there it was a clue, right, that this is what we're making. So injecting water mist, if it's the mist, if it's the fog, why not just work with that directly? And that's exactly what Stan Myers did. That was his last invention. Stan Myers was a big, big proponent of electrolyzers, and he went for years doing electrolyzers. And when he switched to the water injector plug, that's when he really got his big effects to, for example, dry, making a vehicle run on it. He's famous for the doom buggy running on, on, on the, uh, at first the electrolyzer, but then from the injector plug. And so there was the plug. His plan was to retrofit automobile with the water fuel injector plug. And here, this is from the Canadian patent application. We'd have water ionized air, and he had some uh, argon that he put, put into it as well. And we get the, that plasma going. Here's, it's kind of like a little mini sh uh, shower nozzle, right? Getting that spray going in with that mixture. 
Right, and then the argon, was, I would assume, is just to increase its conductivity. Well, it's, it would help make the plasma. They, they've seen argon and sun and luminescence and things like that. I think right. he was inspired. You know, uh, they're not, Stan Myers was very, very inspired. He would, like, channel information. And, and so he was just inspired to do that. Uh, it was complicated because he had to provide a lot of energy to make the plasma. He had to make, make that mist in the plasma. So he had some lasers and ionization going on just to energize that, that mist. Who doesn't, who doesn't says, love a laser or two? I mean, that's you got to have a laser or two yeah. in your lab. Yeah, but fortunately, <laughs> we'll find out it's going to be a simpler still. Yeah, which is good. But they were celebrating. They wanted, He wanted to make a factory to mass produce these water injector plugs. He felt he could retrofit automobiles with this uh, for maybe 2000 bucks a piece. And he was celebrating with some Belgian investors, and they were out to at a restaurant. And then there's the story of the poisoning. He, he got poisoned. It seemed like these guys weren't really uh, investors at all. They looked like they were uh, operatives out to assassinate him. And then this is the story of his death. Uh, Dean Narcisco uh, um, was an investigative reporter, and he dug up the details. There were audio tape interviews, but those two mysterious Belgium investors, those, those audio tapes just went missing. And so there's the Stan Meyer story. So Stan was the closest because there he was, just the water mist itself, the ionized water mist. So we asked, so why do some electrolyzers succeed and, and most fail? And this, this was what I was researching because most people, they're just doing hydrogen. And here was the breakthrough for me. They made abundant nanobubbles, something that I personally was not aware of until very late in the game. And basically, the nanobubbles is a water structure. I, I knew there had to be some type of cluster. I knew I needed that particle to surround, to make the ball lightning, to make the plasma. But it could, I did not know what it, that it would exist until I discovered the Japanese work. And it was in 2015 that I learned about nanobubbles myself. And there's a, a kind of a, there's a cluster of it. And when it comes off, uh, an electrolyzer, you can trap a little bit of hydrogen inside of it, inside this cluster form. Uh, this was a great website because Martin Chaplin is a professor. He gathers up all the current research on water and uh, makes it available on his website. So it's a tremendous website for any, any of the research around water itself. And the nanobubbles were not believed to exist at all. They just could not understand how the how the curvature, the high curvature could, could be stable. Because in all their bubble theory uh, was always basically like the surface tension from the weak hydrogen bonds of, a wa of the water. And it was very weak. And un under strict curvature, they, 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 they would just break. There was no possibility that it could be stable. And so they were puzzled. They refused to believe the existence that bubbles this small could, could be stable. And it wasn't until the Japanese who made the breakthrough in 2006, demonstrated from laser backscatter under a microscope, they could track the individual models, I'm sorry, the individual bubbles themselves, that the water community finally acknowledged their existence. And, and they're still there. Now there's plenty of articles on it, but they're very, very puzzled. Why are they so stable? Because the simple theory of surface tension hydrogen bonding, this cannot explain it. And they're incredibly uh, strong. In fact, these that like to hug the surface, these surface nanobubbles, are a huge surprise how strong they are. In fact, on this experiment, they show they can withstand an abrupt, an abrupt uh, overpressure. If about 60 atmospheres, this abrupt pulse, they would like, you know, squash down and bounce right back. They're not destroyed from this. This just amazed them that the strength of these nanobubbles. It was the Japanese who explained why they're so strong. And this was from Ta Takahashi. He's the big professor, big name for this discovery in Japan. Discovery was in 2006. They're strong because they cocoon a net amount of charge. So as you know, water's, water molecules polarize and it would like to, it gets attracted towards charge. And you can imagine the membrane around that 
starting to align and get attracted towards the charge that cocooned inside. So the act, the surface then, because it's attracted towards the charge inside and because it's perfectly right. symmetrical, that membrane ends up becoming very, very strong. Like an atomic um, or a molecular, I should say, a molecular uh, coulomb barrier. Yeah, like, like strong. So the net charge is cocooned inside, and that's what attracts it towards it. So imagine that symmetry of the polar water, polar water molecules aligning appropriately to be attracted towards the center symmetrically. All of a sudden, this membrane, which would be normally very, very fragile, becomes very, very strong. So we, we have to look at the details, which have not been worked out about exactly what would that structure be that symmetrically uh, gets attracted towards the charge. But intuitively, you can see it. When it gets attracted towards it, it lo interlocks in and becomes very strong. And finally, I discovered my strong particle that I needed to, to make uh, the ball lightning. This had to exist, and it wasn't until 2015. So I'm late to the party. 2010 is when the water community finally accepted it. And I learned about it uh, in 2015, just studying the Japanese work. And, and then I made the breakthrough. There was my water cluster structure that I did, that it was needed to explain it. And boy, did I find a lot of supporting evidence. A little bit was foreshadowed from the uh, work of Andrea Puharch. I was a friend of his. He uh, made this observation in his electrolyzer. And he was doing this work. Uh, in the 80s, and what's really nice about this patent, the body of the patent talks about his observations. He would look very carefully with a magnifying glass, and these were the larger bubbles, but he said they're surprisingly strong. They are polarized. They like to hug each other. And so he was seeing these somewhat anomalies on the bigger bubbles themselves. And so there was, if what makes nanobubbles, and we're going to see all these things make nanobubbles, so electrolysis, cavitation, uh, microchannels uh, can be carved to make nanobubbles, pulsing, waveforms help, help make the bubbles come off the plates, and that's where the ultrasound frequencies come in. All these, so electrolyzers that tended to make nanobubbles would then manifest the anomalies of having too much energy. So there was the breakthrough. So, Electrolysis itself, here's a study uh, under stroboscopic magnification of, of nanobubbles forming. They form all the time, all electrolysis makes them every time. The nanobubbles first form on the plates, they gradually grow up to microbubble size. The microbubbles burst open, free, uh, freeing up the molecular hydrogen. So we have it on every single, all electrolysis is naturally making them all the time. And these bubbles start to grow. Even mechanical, so, mechanical oscillation too, right? I mean, that's what you mean by cavitation on the well, three yeah, slides Well, the back? cavitation helps to make them, but we'll see. What we got to do is get them off the plates. Okay. So uh, all the cavitation turbulence, narrow gaps, we, all this can shear the nanobubbles off early, right? That's why, that's why these electrolyzers, uh, the various things they were doing were important because the idea was to get them off the plates early. And that's why conditioning electrosurface work ended up working because it would stop the nanobubble growth and get them off before they grow into microbubbles. So all this was helping to get off the nanobubbles, off the electrolyzers. It's interesting. You're familiar with the uh, Pons and Fleischmann experiment too, right? Yes. It's interesting that they kind of talked about that same thing about their p palladium, that it had a rough surface. Like that was kind of one of the key indicating, you know, it was one of the ways that they, they noticed things supposedly, and that's something that other people didn't replicate. It's funny that you say that it kind of ties right in with, with what they're talking about as well. I yeah, well, sir, I, can, I can go, I can really go off on uh, that. <laughs> I'll make a long story short because it was a great story. All right. Basically, what was happening and when they uh, load up the palladium or, or nickel supersaturation, it starts to crack. And the cracking was the important phenomenon. When that, when that crystal cracked, it made the uh, fracto emission plasmoids, just like earthquake lights. 
And as people were, were doing experiments, they would observe the best of, where they get the heat anomaly was when, when the devices would actually crack. Uh, Ed Storms was famous in saying the cracking of the crystal was, was very important. To, um, and probably the peak of cold fusion happened in 1996 with the pattern cell because Patterson uh, may, used electroplating on beads, alternating nickel and, and palladium. And he had a technique for separating good beads from bad beads. And when he worked with good beads, he could then load them in light water, normal water, not deuterium, right. but light water. Uh, he could generate the heat anomaly every single time because he always worked with good beads. He had a technique for uh, just examining the beads and making sure he only had good beads. And one of the problems was that, that when he loaded them, he would get the heat anomaly, the beads would crack, and the beads would eventually flake. It was the cracking that that was the important phenomenon that made the plasmoid. And the other piece of evidence that he had was in the residue, he had have evidence of transmutation. And so these plasmoid strikes and things like that, uh, there's a whole whole talk on, on the Russian work, they exhibit a transmutation phenomenon, which is completely outside our paradigm of what can happen in normal science, <laughs> that you get transmutation so easily. And um, that that's a whole fun topic. That I have a whole slide presentation just on that. <laughs> uh, how, you get, how you get that. In, in fact, it kind of explains how sometimes we, we can see transmutation in the residue from, from the uh, electrolyzers, from, from the plates themselves. So it all kind of comes full circle that these plasmoids and definitely are, are out of anomaly with their energetic events, including that. And there's a conference every year on that, Ball Lightning and Transmutation. That's the title of the conference. And they, they, the Russians take it very seriously, and they have the repeating experiments. And so, and so there, there you have your nuclear ash that's fantastic, that's producing transmutation. So far out of the paradigm in, in the West, our Western academia just ignores that work. It won't even look. And then we have, we have these huge anomalies. And so the other way we can get it, the ultrasonics, here where that 40 kilohertz frequencies really are really helpful. They help dislodge the bubbles. Right. So whenever you drive the electrolyzers and that, if you can hit mechanical resonances that like to vibrate the plates that are in the 40 kilohertz region, you'll dislodge, you'll, you'll get those bubbles shaken off before they have a chance to grow. And so one way you can get them off, just do uh, airflow through, through the electrolyzer. So that's what uh, Archie Blue made a car run on it look back in the 70s, blowing air through the, through the electrolyzers. People go, oh, what does that have to do with making hydrogen? Well, oh, nothing, absolutely nothing. And yet that was the key for his device to even work. And so now in hindsight, we can say, oh yeah, just, uh, just blowing air, you're sh shearing off those bubbles early. So you're making plenty of nanobubbles. Any turbulence in the water can help you do that. And this takes us to the work of uh, Ryushin Omasa. Uh, he had snapping blades. Uh, it can even produce cavitation events behind those snapping blades. And boy, what that would do with the, to the water in his electrolyzer, uh, he produced the big anomaly uh, in Japan. And it was studying his work that eventually led me to the Japanese nanobubble research. But he uh, announced to the world back in 2009 uh, that uh, he made this gas that, uh, that from his vibrating blades in the electrolyzer, and he said, gee, I can, I can run a small engine on this without any extra air input. Um, I, I could store the gas under pressure for two years. Now, here is what's important about storing gas under pressure. He intentionally leaked hydrogen. He would make sure his containment would always leak out the free hydrogen. He knew hydrogen under pressure with air is extremely dangerous and extremely explosive. He did not want free hydrogen. He would just basically was able to store this nanobubble type gas. If, when they studied what is the gas at the Tokyo University, it was nanobubbles that cocoon hydrogen. So there he had it, the uh, cocooning a, a proton inside with that net charge. He made a very, very stable gas with this, with this nanobubble. And we're going to see 
that it was really the nanobubble that was more important than the hydrogen itself, because I, it was that strong particle that, that allowed the plasmoid to form up. So Ryushi Masa probably had the most repeated experiments. Uh, and I only knew of his work up through 2015. Uh, the, here's an acronym that, uh, that he invented that sounds just like his name. <laughs> I, so but a lot of people get me. Yeah, my, my son has to come into the room because he forgot that I'm on a webcast this morning. If he comes into the room, I'll, I'll let him know to shush, I'll shush him. So, so the, uh, this video, uh, we could play at the end if you want, but it's, all, it's up on the web. It was, uh, about, it was about five minutes long. Uh, summarizing his discovery. This video was sent out to the world with English subtitles showing the nature of, of his guest. Uh, her, here was his electrolyzer. So there's their side view of him. Here's his vibrating blades. Uh, and he said, gee, when I vibrate these blades, uh, you, you, don't, you can't make big bubbles in the water, right? And his, electro, his electrolysis plates, they had holes in them. I'll show that in a second. Here, here he talked the importance of snapping the blades. He was, went to all the detail of how to make, uh, how to make these blades affect the water like that. Yeah, it's all very well documented too. And uh, Martin, uh, Martin Fleischman Memorial Project. I know Bob Grenier went out there and talked with him as well. And that's and it was amazing some of the things that he was showing. Like we talked about earlier, the uh, HHO torches, the, the, uh, the Maza gas, you know, it was doing the same thing as a lot of HHO experimenters talk about being a very cool flame, but then being able to literally vaporize tungsten and stuff, like just really interesting stuff. Yeah, did the same thing. This is important too. He had holes in his plates. He made sure that water got in there. He lost right. half a surface area. If you were if you were interested in hydrogen, you'd say you're crazy. You just you just dropped your surface area, dropped the amount of current you want. He if the hydrogen wasn't important. He didn't know that at the time. Uh, I don't know if he still does. I'm trying to get in touch with him to see uh, get my book over to him. I think he peaked in 2011. There's a Japanese news special. This was prime time in Japan. The whole country got to see this, this news special about his work. Uh, this, here's his acronym. There's his blade. Let's see how big that blade is on the vibrating blade on the electrolyzer. He got a scooter to run completely on the gas, 100%, a small engine. He would mix uh, propane you know, when he was riding, driving a car on, on the gas. Uh, and, um, Did, do you know what the propane was for? What his purpose for is making yeah, it stable? Yeah, you know, in this case, the reason for auxiliary fuel, you make a lot of plasma with it. An auxiliary fuel definitely helps. And that's why uh, electrolyzers with some hydrogen and uh, adding a little bit of gasoline, we'll go, go into that in a moment. It helps you make plasma. Because if you're trying to do a pure experiment, it's tough, right? You can only do a small engine. In fact, on this experiment, the generator projects are the best ones to do. You run it driving a small engine, 3,600 RPM standard speed. It's easy to work with, single cylinder. And so you uh, generators are the best experiments, to the best device to use to prove that you're way, way uh, have your big energy and um Right. And so in this graphic from the video, they said, gee, I'm putting two kilowatt hours worth of energy in and I'm getting five kilowatt hours out. Right. I'm over unity on this thing. It puzzled the panel. How can we explain it? See, they couldn't right, explain it. And here it talked about mixing the propane in with with the generator itself. I'm, and my, I had the same argument. Why are you cluttering your experiment? and obscuring the discovery. You showed you could do a small engine on the pure gas, work with the pure gas and, tr and truly prove that, you, that you're uh, over unity. Of course, it costs some energy to make the gas, but he found out that, yeah, if you, if you have some natural gas or any uh, combustible in there, you make a lot more plasma and, and you get the big effect. Now we're claiming over unity from, from this measurement. So I was eager to get a hold of Ryushi Masa, and I found out he has not been seen publicly speaking ever since 2012. So after this news special came out, uh, n nothing, no, no announcements or anything else. You go to a website of his, of his uh, 
company, they, like they put him out the pasture, that doesn't talk. Apparently, I think he was suppressed. They just uh, basically gave him a project to work on, paid him well, and said, you won't talk about this anymore, and that is that. Well, like, so, like I said, uh, just, I mean, recently, really, like, uh, I want to say six months ago, I think, uh, he, he was, um, he connected up with Bob Grenier of Martin Fleischman Memorial Project, but in doing so, he, de he definitely didn't want to be on camera and he didn't want to talk and stuff, so it was really interesting, but he opened up his, his lab to him, so it's a good reference to check out. Oh, and, and prior to that, well, I was eagerly seeking publicity, so he right. was really... Uh, he was last seen, I think, publicly speaking at the Emotor Water Conference in 2012. That's really interesting. So that, that was kind of it. And then he's just gone silent. In fact, a lot of the suppression is that way. It's a benign suppression. We'll, we'll see the others where you're basically paid off. You're, you're ba given an offer you can't refuse. You I might as well take the money. Sometimes I wonder, too, if it's just people lose hope, right? You put They put so much effort out there and nobody really believes them or nobody is actually replicating any of their experiments. So then it's like, yeah, it's then it's almost like a like, well, what's the point if nobody even is listening type of deal? Well, you could you could breach the marketplace yourself. Go ahead and mass start mass producing. You know, you'll see what happens. Just like uh, happened to Stan Meyer. Uh, if you try to breach the marketplace, uh, suppression occurs, and that's been the pattern every time. That's why I think the the actual solution is to go open source. Like most of the most of the HHO community went open source with their electrolyzers, yeah. so the, most of the people are sharing it. But it's because of suppression is the real reason to do so. So uh, uh, historically, uh, a lot of people conditioning electrodes. They thought it was very important, and it turns out basically the act of having a residue on the surface, you're carving micro, micro channels on that surface. And the advantage of that surface is now the bubbles as they form up in the channels, they emit from the plate. They don't get a chance to grow big. And then we're starting to emit them as nano bubbles. And this is why the conditioning on the electrodes on electrolyzers actually help. And since there, there, I covered a little bit about it because this was well shared by, by the different inventors uh, to conditioning electrodes. and. It's, we'll see. It's not that important today, uh, because we're gonna we're gonna see from Walt Jenkins that we're gonna have a better better way of doing the whole experiment. But this is historic. Why did conditioning electrodes help? Uh, Ravi Rajiv was famous. He was working with tap water in India, and uh, that is not a scientific uh, controlled experiment. Tap water in India. The only thing you know for sure about that water is you mustn't drink it. <laughs> But uh, he he got in touch with uh, Dave Lawton, who showed him, oh, this is what you got to do. He played around with uh, Stan Meyer electrolyzers in the 80s and 90s. He said, this is what you got to do. You got to condition those plates. And he was very successful. Dave Lawton is famous. He's very open source. He's a really, really good engineer. He's from Harnwell Labs, really top-notch top type of scientist. Right? And he really dove into the Stan Meyer stuff. So this was the electrolyzer type experiments. And Ravi Uju was very open source explaining it. And he was finally successful conditioning electrodes. Dave said, oh, it's going to take you about a month, but this is the type of stuff you got to do. And well, it took a long time. But nonetheless, he was still successful. But this is what he stressed. And everybody stresses this. Once you condition those plates, do not touch them. These are very, very delicate micro channels. As soon as you touch them on the plates, you wreck, wreck the surface. And that's why it was important never to touch it because we were actually carving out those micro channels as we were making the surface. Bob Boyce was probably did the most to really get the open source movement going on the electrolyzers. He's very open, sharing the work. And he shared, this is how you can condition these electrodes uh, in, in three days, and he had his technique that he shared on, on getting that uh, residue of, in this case, the potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide, whatever you want to use. And after conditioning, once again, uh, you don't need the electrolyte anymore. And so you would get the, get the effect. So that's uh, why the conditioning was so important. Uh, if you don't want to condition them, just make a jacket surface. And that's what Paul Zagoras did. He... Uh, I got to meet him in person in 2010 and 20, I think it was 2007. He's trying to sell these electrolyzers on eBay. 
and uh, he was successful, maybe selling seven before he got shut down. He had very narrow, narrow gaps, boy, on the order of uh, 100 millimeters. Amazing to yeah. engineer it that well. So that's a difficult thing to do. He uh, used sandblasting to roughen it, he, uh, or media blasting. He would uh, uh, hit it at, at, at an angle to make the nice sharp uh, craters. Nice, uh, the craters had a nice sharp lip on them. Here's a picture that he shared with me of his media blaster. And here, uh, here's an example how well they could emit gas. I, th I can go ahead and play this. This is Walter McNichols. He was one of the guys that grabbed the electrolyzer early before it was shut down. Purchased it off of eBay or whatever. Or, or he knew, or he knew Paul directly. Okay. And so, so this thing was a huge amount coming right off. So. So there, so they, uh, so Paul just roughed them straight up, and here's uh, what he did. Also, drew, used a 40 kilohertz frequency, and he noticed that if he, that if he modulated that frequency a little bit, he would maximize the emission. So he's looking for actually mechanical vibrational modes on, on the plates themselves in this in this on this kilohertz drive, to kilohertz drive, to uh, get those bubbles off, and uh, the rough surface really helped. And uh, he actually made a car run. That's why he's famous. He got this car running on, on it. I got a whopping three miles per gallon, <laughs> right, uh, of water, right. right, on the electrolyzer. So, Pretty impressive. So, and then there's a suppression story associated with him. You can read about it on the web. He was shut down. And get, they can no longer sell him. He was bought out, right. Phillips Petroleum uh, reimbursed him for all his expenses, and he was supposed to just cease and desist and uh, stop entirely, and he went on to other things. Uh, there's web discussions about his work. Uh, here's the, the feed system. He just feed the water right in, immediately converts to gas as he feeds it to that carburetor, uh, into the engine, through the carburetor. So narrow gap electrolyzers were very, very well stressed uh, and from the community when they go, we get the anomalies. So we get plenty of sputtering and turbulence, and basically in all that activity, scraping the bubbles right off the plates. The Anton cell, a very well-engineered cell out of Germany, uh, had a very narrow narrow gap, was used successfully in a self-running device. Uh, Steve Eaton, in November 20, uh, not 2009, was trying to share with the world his, his open source. He's trying to share by uh, using these cylindrical uh, type electrodes, and you see that fishing line. That's how he separate kept them separated. Yeah, nylon forcing the smart. yeah forcing the gas to spiral all the way up. So he had to keep all that turbulence going all hmm. the way up uh, those electrodes to finally get it out. That's a pretty cool idea. Uh, and he was, here's his big claim: self-running a genset. Right, which is I mean that's like the gas. holy grail, really, because if yeah, you can have course. a self-sustaining machine and that kind of i mean that's an engineering proof uh, right and then the engineering proof a closed loop self-sustaining very you know there is six extraordinary liters, claims though right? little, <laughs> tiny yeah tiny little amount you know six liters per minute right of this gas it's nothing right yeah. to make this stuff running for all the reasons i said before he had this spectacular claim and then the website was attacked and the information was was what withdrawn he he demanded uh, from his partner, that's where these photos came from, Jeff Sokol, uh, to stop everything, went silent, never to be heard from again. And this, he was a good engineer. Hmm. Uh, uh, you know, I think he had a master's degree in nuclear engineering, and uh, he had a career as an engineer, a, a tremendously talented inventor. Quite pedigreed. And, yeah, yeah, really, really, really good guy. So I thought he really, I thought he did. I thought you're going to punch this through by sharing, sharing your information. Boom, nothing. Oliver and Valentine uh, worked with a very crude, they're out of Germany, and they participated in the blogs and discussions, and they were very open about it. Here, they're very crude hobbyists, changing the, the timing on firing the piston at top dead center on, on their device. They worked with the Anton cell. They just grabbed it from them, too, and 
And they took this cart, self-running, and they took it for an elevator ride, and they posted the YouTube up, uh, announcing their discovery to the world. And then shortly thereafter, boom, nothing more. Went silent. Now, no more participation. Have you ever have you ever thought that perhaps, and this is just you know grasping at straws, but socially it's not acceptable to, or I wouldn't say it's not it's not that it's not acceptable, but socially it's hard to bring something like this to market because it has so much abundance. Like what investor would would invest in something that they would get no return off of? Do you ever, have you ever considered that as a possibility? Absolutely. I, 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 when an investor asked me, honestly, should I invest in these things? I said, until it breaks through on some open source fashion, it'll get suppressed, right? That's been the pattern the whole time. Uh, over the years, every time an inventor really starts to do the right stuff, boom, uh, there's a suppression story. Basically, you're, you're disrupting, uh, you know, the, the infrastructure of all the energy production. All energy, yeah. So that yeah, be, and all of a sudden you're going to jerk, jerk away that and make it freely ab available to to everyone, right? So the, that's been the pattern, and so uh, I, I agree with you. It's it's premature to invest. The breakthrough has to occur. If you get the engineers on board that this is real, and everybody's working together to make it so, we'll have wonderful technology, right? We're just scratching the surface on on these experiments. But even it, it'll it'll be just even as an investor point of view, though, like it would be difficult to invest in something that you're never going to see a return on, right? I mean, if, if you have abundant energy, you're taking the m most abundant element in the universe, uh, hydrogen, and using that as a medium to somehow, you know, you know, what, all, all these phenomenons that we see, what, whether you believe it's a vacuum energy or what, what, whatever it may be, how would an, an investor make money in return, like for the return? Like they'd never see it. Well, It'd be well, like anything else, if once you have something, you you would mass produce it like they do today. You can uh, mass produce uh, generators to run on it. It's just like cars that run on. People will buy it. It's just the industry has to switch over. That's what and we're here for, right? <laughs> yeah, you're not going to corner the market on this thing because the powers that be uh, says you're you're interfering with our business. So a lone inventor doesn't have a prayer uh, punching this through. So, but we can cut to the chase because you don't need hydrogen, right? That's, that's what's, what's amazing. All we need to do is make strong particles. So if we work with just a pond fogger, just a normal fog, there's people on the web that would share this uh, doing it. You don't get much because the fog is too weak, right? Uh, the fog particles are very gossamer. You, you just go right back to water. Right. Well, you, don't, you don't have any stru structure. It's not strong. But that's where Walter Jenkins made the breakthrough. By having the grid, the electrostatic grids, he would get that fog charged. And that's why uh, he uh, basically did the big, big breakthrough for the science of all of this. All we needed was that strong particle. We didn't need hydrogen at all. He does not make hydrogen at all. It allows his work to provide the, the key experiment removing all auxiliary fuels to show we just need that strong particle and a lot surrounded by a lot of plasma. Strong particle of water in this case, right? Of, of, of water, right. because it's the same principle, the charged fog, right, drop a little water, but the same membrane. As long as I cocoon a little bit of charge inside of there, the same strength on that membrane for the same reason the nanobubbles are strong occurs and we, we get our breakthrough straight up with basically charging fog. Uh, it's, so the, this is tremendously exci exciting because <clears throat> we simplified it. We, we made the simple definitive experiments. So kudos to Walt Jenkins because he really, really made the, the real discovery. And perhaps the best is yet to come. <clears throat> uh, here we're, we work with uh, on the order of a megahertz because it made visible fog. But it's possible to go up in frequency, and the same principle applies. You can make smaller particles. This would be a fuel that would be invisible. You couldn't even see it at all. And you can easily have certain resonances up at higher ultrasonic frequencies that make even smaller particles of fog, the cocoon charge. And you, instead of having perhaps millions or thousands or millions per piston stroke, you can end up having billions of them inside uh, the piston. 
and um, nobody's even bother, has even tried exploring here. There's no motivation yet to explore it, or at least but that we there, know of. <laughs> yeah, there could be there could be frequencies that seem to produce a lot more of the smaller particles. We until you have laser backscatter or some way to measure, you're not going to find right. out. But the but the future is extremely bright. And what's wonderful about using these particles and the anomaly they produce, you don't need to use very much of it at all, right? A few million per, per downstroke of the piston, they're, they're so tiny, you're hardly using any water in the system as you're doing it. But it's important though, if we're doing a pure water experiment, we gotta get a lot of plasma in there so that we can surround those particles by plasma so we can make the ball lightning forms, the plasmoid forms. And that's where the idea of the wide plasma spark plug comes in. And, and Walt had to invent his own to, to, to do this if he wanted to do pure water experiments. Uh, Robert Krupa has a patent for shaping electrodes to produce plenty of wide plasma. And so the, nobody can really claim that anymore. Robert Krupa got the claim and he was focused on just gasoline, more efficient gasoline combustion, as well as a very robust a spark bug that doesn't really well, wear down. The patents are coming up here, though. Like, I think it's 20 years for patent, right? Unless it's renewed. But yeah. Of course. Of course. It, it reminds me of, um, of uh, what is it? The, like, uh, like, we talked about this before, too. The Fonsworth fuser. Like, the way that it's shaped with the, what did they call it? Yeah, Philo Farns Farnsworth thought he was making fusion uh, because he was seeing, uh, I guess, some gamma reactivity, some activity like that, or neutrons right. uh, coming from it. But he usually could have been doing plasmoid type experiments where it was causing transmutation type events, et cetera, that would produce the neutrons. So we were have a different paradigm, different way of looking at it. Right. It wasn't, didn't have to be doing fusion. But, but I tell you, transmutation is worse as far as being out of the paradigm than just some deuterium fusion. And so that's <laughs> why that's swing. why it's ignored. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> We're not, our, our standard theories just have a long way to go. We definitely have a paradigm violation. Whether you want to accept zero-point energy or any other proposal that you're going to come up with, you're, you're, you're out of the paradigm, and, and uh, it typically will not be believed by yeah. the academic community. Unfortunately, yeah. And uh, people played around with this. Here's an example from some of the hobbyists. I liked I liked his ideas on the different shapes that he really patented. I like this dimpling one especially. You know what happens when you dimple? Uh, you get a little hollow cathode. You build up some glow plasma before you make your discharge, your spark discharge, and that helps make it more uniform. So that you build up a little bit of glow plasma and then. And then, you, then you hit it with a pulse and you get a really nice uniform spherical plasma front. So we're trying to spread out the plasma to convert those particles over. So you can see here, example, uh, where uh, how much more plasma you get from using these type of spark plugs. Using capacitive discharge to get a lot more, get that plasma a lot wider is well known. Uh, they use it for race cars, for race car spark plugs. The capacitive discharge, right? So you get a lot more plasma because you're just trying to be as efficient as you possibly can for the, for the race cars themselves. So they're commercially available. Here is a built-in cylindrical capacitor for the Pulse Star plug. Um, uh, this project was done uh, in my actually in the next town north of me, and I knew one of the inventors, David Yerth. It turns out Monrose is the actual inventor. Um, and it's a wide uh, plasma spherical spark plug, and they they touted uh, materials using very very good materials for large emission and great wear, uh, rather than the shape. And so uh, David shared this video from their experiments uh, that that they did. So here's an example of the spark plug, and then from the bottom here, you'll see they're going to sh just shoot up some fog into it. I think they're just using ordinary fog, uh, not, yeah, or, uh-huh. So, see, and you see how much more energetic it is. Very similar to the other observations that people made spraying the water mist in. So, uh, here's all the empirical evidence. 
uh, the different investigators were doing. So that nice one. Yeah, or uh, high speed photography. Yeah. So Aaron Marikami uh, does does a great job running that conference up in Coeur d'Alene, uh, the Bedini conference. Uh, um, John Bedini recently passed away, but Aaron is doing a great job. But he also works with the team, and they were inventing uh, uh, wide plasma ignition circuits. Basically, capacitive discharge. Here's the capacitor. You, you, a very simple circuit. You start the spark with your normal uh, coil to start the spark, and then you dump the contents of the capacitor onto the spark gap itself. So there we go. Lots of plasma. So combining this type of circuitry, combining his research uh, to drive drive that wide plasma spark plug, you'll get a lot of plasma in there that allows us to do the pure water experiments. So I highly recommend Aaron's work uh, to, to help with that because it's nice, nice and simple for the experiments. So basically there we have it, the pulse plasmoid engine. We, we convert that, there's charge fog over to plasmoids by all this wide plasma spark plug. So there's the key experiment. The pulse plasmoid engine is what I called it 2015. Huge anomalous force ultimately sourced from the zero point energy. So, so your hypothesis or your way, your idea for testing would be to transfer the energy into mechanical mechanical force using this, right? That's kind yeah, of just the because uh, there's, there's so much momentum and success. Okay. And we get the retrofits. Yeah. Uh, retrofit into the internal combustion engine, right? And we start with, with generators. So I'll summarize everything I said. Uh, there, it's a spectacular claim to claim your closed loop as a self running generator. If you're doing that, you'll blow everybody's mind because they know if we, combustion is too inefficient, right? 5x over unity. If it were combustion moving that piston. And what we're showing, it's not combustion moving the piston. It's the anomalous force from from these plasmoids, right. from these EVs. Like with uh, a 20, 30 millions of 20 to thirty percent efficiency on a standard combustion engine, you're you're suggesting that'd be like a COP of five. Like you'd need at least five times. Yeah, energy. you have to be. You would have five times x if you're overcoming all the heat losses. Right. And of course, your circuitry losses as well. Right. But the heat losses are dominating. And so uh, doing, uh, working, that's why when you suffer in a generator, you got your proof, right? You, right. You, you, you've closed off everything. Everybody has to say, oh, it has to be a fraud, but do the experiment yourself. You, you, you'll see it's not a fraud. You'll see it as an anomaly, huge anomaly, and you don't even need to use that much water because the, right. the force from these plasmoids are huge. Uh, the force, uh, you know, over the top energy anomaly, it's huge. And so you're hardly using any water to do to produce the anomalous force itself. Likewise, hydrogen combustion is not can't produce it for the same reason. It's not a combustion event. And perhaps this is the most important slide of the whole deck. We take the charged fire particle, which is very strong. We surround it with the plasma in the white plasma vent. Any any way to produce the plasma. Even if you add a little combustible fuel, it just helps you make the plasma. And that's the point of adding a little bit. That's why a little bit of hydrogen helps. A little tiny bit of gasoline helps. Any of that helps with the practical device. But if you want to prove it with a scientific experiment, you do not want any auxiliary fuel. You just need a lot of plasma. Keep it simple. And so, right. And then it surrounds the plasma, surrounds it. The electrostriction from the plasma band surrounds it. You make the vortex ring and you make the plasmoids. So we can be making thousands, if not millions of these plasmoids per event, per, per combustion event. It's not combustion, per sparking event right. in, in the chamber. And so there we, there we have, here's the primary hypothesis, the self-organization and the zero point energy occurs. You have this ortho rotating phenomena, bending that zero point energy flux, trapping into the plasmoid. The self acceleration phenomenon is what actually moves the piston. And if you started to, to do some vortex circulation in your chamber itself, you'll likely do better still. Uh, like the PAP engine did, they were working with inert gases. Well, that can be a whole nother topic, but the same principle. Inert gas clusters uh, exist uh, after you take them up, mixtures of inert gases to plasma, plasma form uh, by a series of discharges to where you finally have these clusters. 
you surround them by the plasma, you get the plasmoid effect. And what Pap did, he also circulated a large vortex ring from the shape of his, com uh, of his combustion chamber itself. Mm -hmm. But there's the underlying principle. We work with these entities. The water arc experiments were showing the anomaly and it was associated with the fog particles themselves. Uh, electrolyzers succeeded because they were making the nanobubbles. And the nanobubbles, the same principle. They were strong. They cocooned some charge on the inside to make them strong. And at that point, once we made lots of nanobubbles, now we're, we're off and running and succeeding on the same principle of the plas making the plasmoid form. And thus, with the charged par fog particles, we don't need any hydrogen, and that allows us to prove it, prove the point. And that's why it's uh, it's superior than the electrolyzers. And what, you're, what electrolyzers, you mean by no hydrogen, though, is that you don't need it isolated. You don't need it separated. Well, we didn't make it. Right. We didn't make it at all. You don't need to make it. Right. We, we, all, we avoid it by using the ultrasounds and making charged fog particles. We avoid it making hydrogen at all. So we have the clean experiment. Right. That, that's the point, to get the clean the clean proof that we are onto a new energy source. Right, to do the work and then using those those suggested techniques and then um, checking the COP, right? <laughs> right, right. And so uh, this was this more historic. Why did people succeed with the, with the electrolyzers? Right, they were stumbling over over the event uh, over the effect. Eventually, Stan Myers stopped using an electrolyzer. He did the water injector. Ryushin Amasa. Uh, by ca cavitating his blades and making a lot of turbulence. He made lots of, of uh, nanobubble uh, hydrogen in his device, concluding some charge there. And then Walter Jenkins did the best because he didn't make hydrogen at all. He was just using the charge fog itself to make the best ex experiment. Now, in order to not work with an auxiliary fuel, uh, you have to provide all the plasma yourself, and that's where the wide plasma spark plugs become important. That you shape the spark plugs to so we can get that wide plasma out onto all the particles, convert them all right. to, to the ball lightning form, the plasmoid form, the EV form, and then you're proving you have a huge and almost force on the piston. And if you don't like my zero point energy ideas to explain where's all this excess energy coming from and where's all this propulsion coming from, well, feel free to come up with new theories. After we have the experiment, uh, the, 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 and the world accepts this, we'll have plenty of theoreticians jump on board uh, chiming in their ideas. Right. On it. I, I just use the ideas that were already in the physics literature. Right. That's all. Why zero point energy? Because that's what the physicists said exists. Right. And I developing a language. It. Yeah. Developing a language around it, I mean, is, you know, that's, a, yeah. that's what. I just followed it. I connected the dots. Right. So I'm not the inventor of any of this, really. I just saw. Uh, how the pattern worked. Well, the, I, I'm standing on the shoulders of the giants. The guys that did experiments like Ken's shoulders. Everything just connects up just beautifully. Once we discovered that the nanobubbles were stable, then you can explain how the fog particle is stable. Right. Right. Same principle. And there we go. We and then the definitive experiment is just work with with the thunderclap idea. Just work with the fog particle straight up. It's a little more of work to do the proof of the experiment because it requires, we got to provide all that plasma from the capacitive discharge right. and from the wide plasma spark plug, but we get the proof, self-running and gen set just from the charge fog. Thus, I predict Walter Jenkins is destined to become more famous than Stan Meyer because he really put it all together, got his vehicle to run run on it. Uh, he, he made it, he made uh, using the pond fogger and the wide plasma spark plug, he put everything together. Right, and it's right there in this 2011 patent application. Thus, is the first to file on this idea, and thus he is credited for making the discovery. So, right. if humanity gets this uh, pulse plasmoid engine, uh, Walt Jenkins truly gets gets the credit for, for being the, the, the and recognition, yeah. and really the intellectual <laughs> property rights uh, for 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 making the primary discovery. Right. And so basically what we do is we mimic a thunderclap and we change the world. <laughs> so That's an excellent there's presentation. My, uh, that's a presentation. Yeah. And um, I have book, books out. Uh, over the years, I've gave talks uh, since really since the 70s. And these books are collections of, of my papers associated with uh, attending the conferences and the presentations I've given over the years. 
And um, yeah. this book, on T. Henry Moray, was my slide deck on the Moray device. Everybody's yeah. begging for copies of the slide. And I say, what the heck? I'm destined to make this book anyway. Because the, <laughs> the name synchronicity of, of uh, Moray's last name matching my first name. And, uh, and I was after I discovered the zero point energy existed and I got all excited about it. I got invited down to Chris Bird's house. We shared the book, The Sea of Energy in Which the Earth Floats by T. Henry Moray. And when I saw that last name, it was like I got hit between the eyes by the proverbial two by four. I said, now you've got my attention. Right? And, and I was, felt I was destined to, to explain it ever since. So I knew that the zero point energy was, was going to be part of it. Moray didn't know it existed. He believed in the ether uh, at the time. And, and it, it turned out that it was the plasmas in his tube, and he was the one that stressed the ion motion was very, very important for him to get the effect. And so I took, I took his hypothesis very seriously, and sure enough, as I matched his hypothesis up to what was described in the vacuum polarization uh, descriptions of, of nuclei and ions and plasma, everything fit together. The, the, ion, the motion of the ions was the critical uh, thing to do, and then trapping it in the plasmoid turned out that's where all the evidence was that we're producing this excess energy from, from experiments, especially of Ken Shoulders. And here's the newer book. It, it, it was the work of Walt Jenkins reading that patent. That's what knocked my socks off. It, it uh, All the dots to connect together. Uh, and everything just fit perfectly together, uh, the whole nine yards. And so that precipitated the, this book into existence. And essentially, the, the slide deck is the summary of it, explaining why historically these various electrolyzers and the various anomalies around uh, the water and the plasmoid work, everything came together. Uh, peaking with Walt Jenkins, who came up with the, the dramatic simplification of it all. I got the cover story of Infinite Energy Magazine in 2012 on this topic. Uh, and this is a presentation I gave with uh, Gary Hendershot, uh, Paradigm Shifts. And basically we focused on, in, in conversation, what's stopping us? The, the discovery is, is seems to be there. Everything, uh, the inventors have done it. The plasma experiments are there. Uh, what do you think? This is where I love to in, engage the audience. What's stopping us? I, I mean, my personal opinion um, is, you know, for one, people don't have a hard time accepting things like that are that encourage a lot of change. But I think like the biggest reason is kind of our social dynamic right now is based around the scarcity and monetary gain and stuff like that. It's, it's, it'd be, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who is deeply entrenched in, in capitalism and, and, uh, you know, the way that we have things structured so socially that would be on board for something like this. Cause it completely, it would, ru it would destroy kind of how they live their lives, you know? So, and, if, and unfortunately yeah, I mean, a lot of those people are interested. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of the that's kind of the big dilemma that we all face uh, as a, as a species. I feel like in, on the planet, right? I mean, we all have gifts and passions, but to be able to do it harmoniously with each other is is is, is a challenge, right? That we all face. So, I don't really have an answer to that as, except for you know I'm gonna do my best to be a better person myself, right? But um, other than that, like that would be my reflection on it. Yeah, I would say that that's it. As people, as different people chime in, oh, it's the oil interest and, and the oil company. Then some, you know, get into oh, right. conspiracy theories. Those who want to control the world want to make right. sure there's an energy shortage, so all humanity is beholden to them for the, for their energy. If right. you all of a sudden you had it easily, everybody can have a gen set run their homes. Everybody's car run, run, runs on it easily. Uh, we free humanity, right? right? Well, but I took it enslaved. I, like in terms of simplicity, right? Like if the root cause, the root problems, right? Would I mean all those things arise from kind of the root problem of of us using um, fractional reserve banking and a fiat currency that is backed by nothing and th this whole idea of scarcity in the first place. And then there's people who obviously enjoy to pull strings, right? They enjoy to 
um, own countries and own things. You know, they're very, you know, and the the real challenge is the the real challenge is how do how do we help people like that transition into a more abundant um, abundant type of society where they're not going to bring something you know they're going to bring something to the table that's going to help with their with what they're passionate in which is obviously owning things or you know manipulating power <laughs> right yeah I, w I would say essentially uh, i'm agreeing with you the the primary the primary thing that stops us is belief uh if uh, mo most people would say i can't believe it it's it's too fantastic i just can't believe it so most people just will invest uh an engineer or normal scientists, uh, anyone in academics says, I never heard of it, therefore it can't exist. And so what stops people from doing the experiment is actual belief. Why waste my time with something that clearly, clearly is impossible? It can't be, it can't be. Never heard of the zero point energy, right? That's what they said. Never heard of it, can't, it can't exist. Right. I, I talk to engineers, I talk to different scientists who are not physicists, right? Uh, why why can't why can't it exist? And the number one reason I, I engaged a professor right at one of the energy conferences. Why can't it exist? His answer was because I never heard of it. <laughs> yeah, that's not a very that, good that was scientific approach. <laughs> and when I and, right, and I said, well, you know, it's in the literature. I said it's in it's in the standard physics journal, and every year there seems to be a popular article on it. Scientific Americans uh, Discover magazine. And what he said to me was, I don't read those articles. Right. right. So th I think well, I think that really, really summarized you know, that, 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 that kind of set it all. It's my beliefs, and you could say humanity is governed by their beliefs. Oh, yeah. And see, we believe that, that there's nothing there, there is no, uh, can't be this other energy source, and that's our belief. You could just decree those physicists are wrong. And that's just so many engineering professors would say that. Oh, those physicists that, that think there's higher dimensions or they think there's this underlying zero point energy and, and, and this type of thing, they are simply wrong, right? right? It can't be. They said, why Dismissal. can't it be? Right, it's because I haven't heard of it. It was always just circular reasoning, right? Are you willing to look? Some would say no, and some would say yes. The people that said yes, they got intrigued. He says, well, maybe there's something to it. Well, it requires an experiment. He right. says, yeah, that exactly it requires an experiment. And uh, the repeating experiment uh, has to be done. And the easier the experiment, uh, the more it can repeat. Right. And uh, since most people are unwilling to try, it's going to have to come from the hobbyist community, people that are willing to try. People on the fringe. I mean, and most uh, most discoveries, like great discoveries, happen there on the outside of this main scientific community. I mean, really, I mean, even like even theoretically, like you look at Einstein, he was until he became super famous. He uh, was very much on the outskirts of French science. And he actually got popular on the uh, he actually won his Nobel Prize on the photoelectric effect, which is something that's, you know, a, a, a real phenomenon. Right. We notice. Right. But then his theory of relativity and stuff obviously gets a lot of, you know, <laughs> a lot of publicity, right. it was, but it's still just a theory. Well, the Right, the theory of relativity is, is uh, amazing. Why in the world? We're coming out of the you know, 19th century. It looked like classical physics, uh, Maxwell's equations, uh, Newton's laws. They looked like it was the theory of everything. It could explain everything. In fact, it was called uh, the golden age of science. Well, are they laughing uh, at our, at our my, geekery? Yeah, yeah they're, uh, they're laughing, laughing at how, at how, big, how big of nerds we are. Yeah. How dare they? How yeah. Dare. Yeah. Well, guys laugh in the other room. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. I can't believe it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah, the, very, very. I, I, when I talk about this stuff I'm around my, my wife, the same, same thing happens. You hear giggles. Oh, and, so my, my family is visiting for uh, across the uh, Thanksgiving right. weekend. So we got we got a kind of crowd here so but it's, it's still fun to do. but basically that, that's that's what the bottom line is people don't believe it yeah and so they don't try and uh so you'll uh and the physicists when i when i really drill in, in with the physicists that really know about it uh they they said you know if you're right it means that the zero point energy the vacuum fluctuations the nature of the quantum vacuum becomes more important than uh 
what we've done so far it means that we if self-organization can exist like this it means we don't have the theory of everything right it means the, these yeah. underlying dynamics we have to start physics all over again it's kind of good too and put on, it, on a new foundation if we had a theory of everything that could explain everything it, i think life might be a little boring to be honest like that would, like then we're, what would we what new boundaries of science would we push for right so Right, well, and that's what was believed, you know, at, uh, at the turn of the century, I was going to go back to relativity theory. Why in the world did the scientific community give up the backdrop of, of three-dimensional space and the linear progression of time across the whole universe? It seemed everything was perfect. The differential equations, space yeah. versus time, those derivatives, everything was perfect. How could we give up the, this, our perfect theory of everything uh, for a kind of a rubbery space time, a distorted well, space time. We lim we limited our belief to the speed of light. I think is pretty much. I mean, this well, uh, that postulate came in, but right. what was it? I, I not, very few people actually know this. What was it about special relativity in 1905 that was so compelling that it would make the scientific community switch off of the foundation of standard space and time, the, the obvious? what it is and it go ahead and accept this notion of this warping space time from from uh from the theory of relativity Are you and talking the changing about like of the pace the of time mickelson morley morley experiments and and the this the um, eradication of the ether type of thing like well, that was that was that was part of what einstein would use it no, but it was more uh, like uh why would there be an acceptance uh, what was it about relativity? What did it provide to to science that uh, that was compelling? That the scientific community were willing to give up their notions <clears throat> of a fixed space and a fixed progression of time. There was something that relativity Excellent. did that was remarkable. That seemed beyond coincidence. It was a breakthrough that that relativity had in its in, in its equations. And very few people know this because you basically have to study uh, uh, electrical engineering or study electromagnetism to find out what relativity actually provided. And I'll give you the answer. What's that? The theory of relativity unified the electri electric field with the magnetic field. Uh, in Maxwell's equations, they were two separate fields. They had a relationship with each other. And it was relativity that showed that the uh, magnetic field is the relativistic contraction of the magnetic of, of I'm sorry the magnetic field is the relativistic transact contraction <laughs> of the electric field right so when whenever a charge would move a uniform velocity is that on your end <laughs> Everybody's suffering. So when a charge moves at uniform velocity relative to you, all of a sudden the magnetic field appears. In fact, more importantly, if you have a, imagine a charge just sitting out in space and you move at a uniform velocity relative to that charge, all of a sudden you're measuring a magnetic field. A magnetic field magically appears because of your motion. Right? These were the equations of electrodynamics. And this unification that of, wow, this is really happening, this unification of electromagnetism is what uh, is why the scientific community uh, accepted relativity. It was a unification in electromagnetic theory. I, I thought that, it was like the, the mass equivalent. So it was a way to explain masses like almost like their charge in a sense if you look at it like how maxwell kind of was describing things as far as and you know the same things apply as far as um the coulomb huh? equations but but it's yeah. uh but it's it's just one way street for gravity right so gravity is just um is just um an attractor there's no there's no anti-gravity supposedly right um but then that was kind of why we all jumped on board because there was we noticed like the rotation of mercury around the sun it was and we right. got precise timing added on to newton's old equations right like to make mm -hmm. and that's so that, that, that that came along 10 years later that was general relativity. okay for general relativity you're talking about special relativity. Spe special okay. relativity 
So the special yeah. relativity says, gee, the pace of time changes depending on, on the observer and right. how they move. And uh, with the speed of light postulate uh, uh, yes. is, is what came in that, that made space and time change. Um, so the reason, so the primary reason that special relativity was accepted was, was the, uh, the unification of elect elect electric fields and magnetic right. fields. Okay. Then, then they started to accept the other notions that the mass increases and all, and all these other uh, Lorenz uh, contraction, and, and, um, et cetera. And that all became uh, measured later. Later on, right. But the, success, the acceptance uh, came uh, with, with um, special relativity was because of that unification. And so because it was an absurd thing to accept, right, the, the, the nature of, of space warping, the nature of time. Then later on, when uh, general relativity became accepted, that's when Einstein says, well, we can have warping of space-time. Let's say gravitational fields do that. And then he made that derivation. Then that was a, a bit of a tougher theory because, uh, you know, Newton's law of gravity was what, what was raining at the time. So right. it had to take these small effects to start to accept general relativity. And then uh, what Wheeler did was put the two together, uh, what was going on with uh, quantum electrodynamics. So also, uh, the ether was, was basically, let's make the ether go away in, in uh, 1905. It's so much simpler to do the physics if we can just make this, this hydrodynamic model go away and to heck with the ether wing and everything else. And then but when 1930s came along and quantum mechanics became accepted. Right. And then they realized the underlying jitter was there in, in, yeah. in, in the, for um, the background and the fabric of space itself, which Dirac provided. That created an explanation of this uh, of uh, quantum electrodynamics. And the equations just seemed to map the experiments so well that it really got a lot of traction. So notice the interesting history of science, that there's a belief in the ether up until 1905, Einstein says, well, the Michelson and Moore experiment, let's just, just pretend it goes away. We don't really need it in our calculations. Then 25 years later, 1930, uh, quantum electrodynamics comes back into play. Then the ether comes right back in with the quantum fields, right. with quantum right. zero-point zero energy. energy. And so uh, the and then if you- The universal it, ground state. <laughs> Yeah, right. and then and then all of a sudden we have this dynamic fabric again. So we have we we fill space. So notice that a 25 year gap in the history of science. We have an ether come up to 1905, then it comes back again in 1930 as as this quantum foam is right. underlying uh, the atomic uh, age explodes. Virtual, virtual, <laughs> yeah, plasma model. Right. So it's amazing that. Uh, we, we're on a better ether theory today than we ever were uh, so before I, that. I have a question. That, that this from dominates. A oh, good. Um, so Ed, Ed Lewis asks, um, what evidence is there for uh, the zero point energy? Like what evidence, uh, empirical evidence is there, I guess, is kind of what he's getting yeah, at. Yeah, so right, for the small effects, it was the Casimir effect uh, attracting the plates, the lamp shift in the atomic uh, hydrogen and things like that. We can actually pose the question uh, back with Ed. I think Ed agrees that uh, plasmoids do exhibit some anomalous energy. And then uh, I guess where would that energy come from? And especially where would the self-acceleration type energy come from? If we don't want to use uh, the zero point energy, uh, what, what will we use instead? Uh, what I found is people that want to believe there can't be any extra energy. And there's real ironies that, that I look at the people that helped me the most, like Peter Gernou, for example, had the best experiment for, for proving the excess energy. He personally believed in empty space and action at a distance. That was his personal beliefs. Uh, the other, other people that believe uh, that it can't come from zero point energy that says, well, it has to come from mass. That's their other energy source. Right. So we don't have we have we can we can take whatever beliefs we want. If we're getting 
and, and come up with whatever theories we want. But if we uh, kind of uh, use the experiments to guide us, we have the manifestation of extraordinary energy here. Right. And if we can self-run a gen set, I uh, say, well, look, we're hardly using any water uh, as we do that because this plasma wave phenomenon is so great. Uh, we could say, you, if you want to explain it by another theory, feel free. Uh, where I'm just I'm just showing the uh, sources from the standard physics literature right. that's pretty well accepted across the board by the physics community. Uh, an esoteric uh, physicist can decree whatever he wants because he's out. Of, he wants to say I'm out of the paradigm, so he could say no ether exists, only empty space exists, and then he's going to say, well, where does the energy come from? He'll have to invent another source of energy and see if he has any luck. <laughs> Uh, convincing folks of that right so basically uh, I'm not the inventor of it right uh, I in fact if I did anything I, I basically I connected the dots I just asked the question what if they are right what if the energy does exist what if the physics community actually might be on to something right. as opposed to saying they're all kooks it can't be and I decree it so that, basically, that, like that, if you were to take a theoretical bet, you would you would put your money on that it's um, you know vacuum uh, or zero point energy that this. Uh, or right, energy. that's and that's just the name or or, right. or the ether, um, and that's that's where we're at today. And I guess what's important is experiments. Right, that are actually okay, demonstrating this get, phenomenon. Right. If right. we could get to a macroscopic experiment, now we're self-running a gen set, for example. Yeah. And then you could say, okay, where does the energy come from? You can now pose the question back out to anybody who wants to come up with another theory. Well, feel free. And the, the, there's uh, another I, big problem too, as far as belief goes, is there's so much stigma to s some type of self-running generator or you know per per perpetual motion, right? It's it's like a it's been a hot point for science forever, right? Because it's you know, and and yet you could say, well, look at the sun. Right, you recognize that as an energy source. Right, it's just saying, does the energy exist? Right. Right. If it exists, then could it be a source? Right. Yeah. It's, it's it follows in the question, does the energy exist? Right. Now it's not an issue of of conservation of energy anymore. The energy does exist. We're just recognizing it as a source. Right. And then we'll go. It. The more right, the more sophisticated question was, well, it's its nature. Is it just random, like background noise? And uh, random things can't can't have to remain random. You can't tap energy from just a, a uniform heat bath, right? For example. But then you ask, well, what is its nature, right? Does it have the self-organizational properties? That means it has to be. You have this coherence going on now. When that happens, you say, oh. It looks like because of its whatever it is, that it can become an energy source. And I, and I suppose the same question occur: How do you know higher dimensions right. exist? Right. It's the same. It's the same. Print. It's the same principle. It'd be very hard to prove it, like without, you know, some experiments, some experiment in place to 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 ask nature the question, right? I, right. Another question: How do you know, like, uh, people observing the, the whole UFO phenomenon? Flying saucer phenomena. Right. Does that exist? C could that be possible in our science? That's that's a, that's a pretty wild topic too. Like, yeah. Sure. And yeah, the a lot of times there's a name. I think it's like Occam's razor or something along those lines, where the simplest explanation is usually, you know, the most likely. Um, uh -huh. So yeah, th like you just brought up a good question. Would be like, well, can we can we do we have technology like that? You know, like like first and foremost like this is it terrestrial does it come from earth because it's obviously people are seeing things there's enough documentation of it but yeah i think that's a well if, if this energy were real then we could see oh it can produce these artificial gravitational fields you just have to warp space time with the energy it's just great it takes a tremendous amount of energy yeah take to a warp space time yeah. well we all we have a tremendous amount of energy in the, in the descriptions of the zero point field so it's just a matter of can we cohere it? So, uh, so th that's how the nature of these questions, does it exist is the first question, right? And then there's the evidence. Uh, the scientific community is, is 
treating it as, as, as if it exists. They, they have trouble maybe with the entropy question, right? right? They have trouble with the higher dimensions. Can it orthogonally interact? They're starting to accept that, <coughs> this idea of an orthogonal interaction. In other words, interaction with the three space from right angles. Right. So these ideas, which were pure, considered pure kook ideas back in the I 70s and 80s when I got started, uh, have become much more acceptable now as we enter the 2000s. These ideas are being kicked around by the physics community as if it's if it's true. They publish it in the journals. And uh, right. what they don't like, they don't like the complexity of self-organization. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's where the physics community really, have, really struggles. They have you don't looked like into, that. Have you looked into uh, Tesla phoresis? Have you ever seen that or heard of that? I... The it's, name's not familiar. So it's self-organizing carbon nanotubes uh, using oh. uh, like electric charge. So it's really, really uh -huh. cool. And they call it Tesla Phoresis because they basically use a Tesla coil. But it, it okay. makes carbon nanotubes like self-organized and they make these like fractal patterns on uh, on the surface of water. It's re really interesting. It's just a, I just a side note because you, you know, as far as self-organization goes, it's, you know, it's up there for interesting things. Right. So, Something to look into. Uh, and and, and pretty sure you wins the Nobel Prize, right, for self-organization, system self-organization. So uh, having interacted quite a bit with the various points of view and the various scientists, I, I can understand where they're coming from. And, uh, and certainly as I interact with my fellow engineers, right, yeah. their, their decree is it cannot exist because I haven't heard of it. So that's it's, that's interesting. That, Some individuals. Uh, let's, let's, let's not generalize. Right, right. Hopefully, not everybody's like that. That would be pretty drab. I think that would be a. Uh, well, <laughs> and a lot of people come around when they learn of it. They right. say, "Okay, maybe it's possible." But I'd say most people would be willing. Oh, yeah, if the breakthrough occurs, we'll be willing to, to have you know ener energy drive our homes and energy for our cars. And most people would accept it. Well, I'm I'm working on it. I'm I'm willing. So I, I've been documenting it, and I've got a, a group of people who all are doing the same. So we're, I think people are out there, different engineers and hobbyists and stuff. Um, I'm I'm not doing a mist uh, using an atomizer or anything in my experiments. I'm just using using an aqua, aqueous solution. But um, I did try, try. I did get a a mister, a little atomizer, just magically appeared. So like couple days ago so i was like hmm maybe maybe i'll experiment with this too so um, yeah you use yeah. you get some electrostatic source and uh, yep. charge it up as you make it make i i got i have some stainless steel screen material so yeah i mean i could i could i could do it and, and i have plenty of high voltage sources so yeah it'd be uh be interesting to experiment with um, yeah we'll just all give walt jenkins credit because <laughs> he, he really made the discovery and, well, and described it very well in his patent application and standing on the backs of giants too i'm sure that he was inspired by other people as well right so that's that's kind of the oh, beauty indeed. of nature yeah he was very inspired yeah well thank you so much for coming on the show like you are a wealth of knowledge for sure i, I mean we could probably go for another two or three hours i could talk, I'd talk to you all day long it'd be fun but Fortunately, yeah. we gotta we gotta end it soon. I'm sure my son's starting to get hungry for lunch and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but this is great. Okay. Anything you want to say on well, closing and? Well, I, I yeah, I would appreciate very much appreciate uh, your your willingness to do this and help uh, help share the information. Well, and, the pleasure's and mine. Willingness, pleasure and, mine. and uh, as you bring all other speakers on on these new paradigm ideas, it's just helping helping to change the world and make a better world. So I really, really appreciate what you're doing. So well done. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I would like to get um, a panel of us together too. I'm hoping to do that maybe at the end of December um, and get a group of us together, to start talking about some of the things like this experiment that we can do as experimenters, like b actually build something, right? That, that works and then we can document it, spread it on social media and it'll become more accepted, right? More awareness to okay. it, so. And that'd be that would be wonderful. That yeah. would really be fun. Yeah. So the more that, the better. Exactly. So we'll see how that goes <laughs> as far as uh, conversations. Maybe maybe we'll, uh, there'll be a, some type of cue where each, peop each person can take their turn talking or something. But it'll be fun. It'll be, it'll be a challenge to do. So um, 
yeah, I'll, I'll hit you up on that later on. And that's just a segue for other people too. For later, later episodes, we'll do a, we'll do a panel discussion. And if you're interested in joining a panel discussion, you can direct message me or hit me up um, in the comments, whatever you'd like to do. So, and then also I'll be posting the links to uh, your, your books and as well, you want me to post the slide deck as well uh, in the description? Okay, I'll post the slide deck as well. Send me the link for that. And, um, and yeah, I appreciate everybody for your support and thank you so much for watching and thank you Moray for coming on. It, it, it's truly an honor. Like it's, I've followed your work for, for quite a long time since I've gotten into, you know, the whole, you know, alternative energy stuff. So, um, so I really appreciate you coming on. No, oh, my pleasure. <laughs> and to that, I, I say adieu. Everyone have a good one. And until next time, adios.